Hello everyone and welcome to episode 283rd of Korea Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Robbie Trevino. He's a concept designer and art director from California, California, United States. And of course, you know, without going into the questions, let me quickly mention that in the four contacts section of the captions, you can find the ID to his Instagram account, the links to his art station, Twitter. And there's also two links down there that if you want to support our today's guest, you can do so through the imprint link, which you can, you know, find prints of his works. And also there's a uh, drawn.com link, which... Uh, we actually talked about this in another, in, a, in another episode with our guest, Al- Al- Alexander Axel van Niederkassel, I think was his name. Uh, they're basically making t-shirts, you know, with uh, collaborating with different artists. And the t-shirts are very high quality. And they're made, you know, through like, you know, ethical, you know, means and everything and all that stuff. So, yeah, the prices might be a little bit higher, but you're actually supporting a good cause as well. You're supporting the artists, you're supporting, you know, the whole art industry so it's basically a nice and middle finger to the whole ai thing so i think that's <laughs> kind of nice and well our this case is actually a very interesting you know case because i actually messaged him like in 2021 same with mikhail kuz because i had him recently on the podcast as well like there's been a recent years of people from 2021 that's that are coming back on the podcast as well that's kind of really, really interesting to me and well he has a wealth of experience in a lot of fields whether it be games movies working with musicians um he, he worked on recently in i think season four of love death robot if i'm not mistaken right uh season three yeah and, and four three. technically yeah not out yet so he has a good juicy portfolio on resume and we're going to talk about it in this episode so stay tuned so well with that introduction out of the way how are we doing today Good man, good. It's uh, it's sunny finally. Weather's looking nice over here in in Los Angeles. If you can believe it, it doesn't. It's not always nice and sunny here. Been getting a lot of rain recently, which is like not what I signed up for when I moved from the state of Washington to Los Angeles to California. But no, it's great, man. It's I'm good. How are you doing? I'm fine, man. I actually the weather's gotten really good here in Turkey. Like you, you go out for one second to buy something from supermarket, you're like, and you feel guilty for staying at home. Honestly, the video yeah. is just so nice. Honestly, yeah, that see, but then like, I don't know if you're if you're trying to get stuff done and it's too nice out, it's like hard because you're like, yeah, you know, I I like I want to be outside. So sometimes like the bad weather is okay if you're trying to be productive inside. Oh yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. and um, well. I gave a brief introduction, but now let's hear it from yours. So give us a little bit of introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Basically, tell us your origin story, if you know what's led you to, you know, become an artist. And also tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Okay, well, let's see. Yeah, I, I guess I was born. No, I'm kidding. We don't need to go that far back. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, I uh, I don't recall like ever like becoming an artist, like, you know, just as an artist, right? I remember going to school and like being focused to become a professional artist, but I feel like as long as I can remember, I've always been drawing or painting or doing something creative. I know at one point I was really into Legos and I was just, I would just build all kinds of things out of Legos before I started drawing things. Uh, But yeah, kind of always been an artist. Uh, Parents have always been pretty supportive of it too, which is cool. Um, But I don't think, I think it was until... I must have been 19 or 20 years old. Uh, I'm 36 now, but 19 or 20 when I decided like, okay, like I think I'm going to actually try to do this professionally. And no one in my hometown of like Detroit, Michigan was, was like, that's a good idea. Like most people from like, you know, blue collar Midwest, like they're, they're going to be like art for a living. Like that's what do you want to like live in your mom's basement forever? Like that sounds like a terrible idea. You know, that's, I think, I think a lot of people, at least where I grew up, they kind of have this sort of caricature of like what an artist, a working artist is, you know, and it's, you know, like the whole, the world of like concept art and like TV and film development. And honestly, a lot of, uh, wow, that's so loud. Apologies. No worries. What is that? Uh, I, I, some kind of vehicle driving by. Uh, honestly, a lot of the world, the modern world that's consumed by, you know, everyone in it is thoughtfully designed in some way or another by like architects, by, you know, uh, city planners, by, you know, automotive designers, like f- fashion designers, like just like humans make up the world that everyone you know consumes and doesn't even realize they're doing that. And no one really you know, considers it. I mean, why would you, right? You're just used to it, but it is this, this thing, right? And 
the more I started looking into like, well, like what could you do with art? Uh, and growing up in Michigan, you know, the, the more I decided, like, I think I want to like, you know, pursue a creative career. And I originally started, if you can believe this, like in car design, because if you know anything about Detroit, it's the Motor City, like a big, there's a big push with the industrial revolution to like mass produce automotive technology like cars. And also you just, when you grow up, like, and you see nothing but like muscle cars and like, you know, fast racing cars and like, you know, tuned cars. Like I just, there's a lot of cars where I grew up. So I was into cars and I wanted to be a car designer at one point, but that didn't really last too long. Once I started going to school, it was uh, the college for creative studies, which is like, it's, it's, um, they kind of do a little bit of ev everything. I feel like at this point, like, you know, they've got illustration, photography, fine art, uh, I think now there is like a, an actual proper concept design, you know, uh, curriculum, if I'm not mistaken. But at the time, you know, car design, probably still car design is like their number one, their biggest, you know, thing that, that people go to school for. And I mean, a lot of the teachers from Art Center have historically taught at CCS and vice versa. Like even Sid Mead used to teach at both back in like, I think the 70s or 80s. And Sid Mead actually gave a talk. Uh, I met him like one time uh, freshman year and I was like, oh my God. But anyway, I, I think maybe a year into the whole like car design thing, I was like, when I found out you were just going to be drawing door handles for like minivans, I was like, uh, it doesn't sound very cool. <laughs> so I just like, I made the switch and I, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But, you know, I remember, I think I still, I think I have, yeah, I have, uh, I've got a bunch of art books. What, what artist doesn't, right? But like, uh, Sid Mead was introduced to me like by an illustration faculty member, like when I was trying to decide what curriculum changes I wanted to make. And they showed me that and they showed me another book called Spectrum, right? Which is, you know, it's this catalog. It used to be an, an art director's sort of Rolodex for the talent that they would hire before like Pinterest and Google and all this stuff, art directors would usually look through like annuals and be like, this is who I want to hire. Here's the art catalog. And now, I mean, Spectrum still makes books as far as I know. Uh, but I remember, you know, seeing it for the first time and seeing like concept art and illustration and all this stuff that wasn't car design and going like, that looks really cool. Like, I didn't know, you know, you could get paid to do something like this. And here's all these amazing artists in one, one location, right? And so I think those inspirations really made me decide to make the switch to it started as illustration because there really wasn't a concept art curriculum and when i was starting at the time too i feel like i feel like this was like 20 2009 i made the switch and then by like 2012 i was ready to graduate the only concept art education i had seen floating around anywhere was either you went to art art center right and like scott robertson and kang lee came out with that uh what was it? It was the Skillful Huntsman book, which I think I still have, right? It's like student work. And, um, but like, other than that, I mean, I think like, if you weren't going to Art Center, you could, you know, watch Nomen DVDs, like DVDs, right? Like that was the thing. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of it. There wasn't a whole lot, you know, there was conceptart.org was this cool, like art forum that everyone was a part of, you know, like I, there, what, concept art was kind of this like nebulous thing. And it was, a, it felt like it was a lot smaller, right? There just wasn't like, it didn't feel like it had the same scale, that sort of community, that industry. It felt like a much smaller, much less uh, significant thing, I guess. Uh, and it feels like it's really grown recently and I guess over the last like decade or so. But but anyway, uh, so back in 2012, you know, I, I graduated with this sort of like illustration portfolio. And this is an interesting story. I The first two years of my career so 2012 when I graduated all the way up to like maybe the beginning of 2014, I didn't, I didn't have any concept art experience under my belt. What I had was just illustration and it was specifically tabletop RPG illustration. Cause what I did is I, when I was graduating, I had to make a senior thesis and kind of focus my portfolio. And I, I had known that wizards of the coast, magic, the gathering and D and D you know, all these, th these are things that, you know, you, you could try, you could aspire to do, right. There wasn't really, a whole lot more I knew about at the time, you know, I think like Paizo had Pathfinder and maybe like White Wolf had some stuff going on, but I wasn't, you know, I basically, what I recall as a kid going to the local uh, games workshop was Warhammer, Warhammer 40k, and then like everything Magic the Gathering. So I thought, you know, I'll try to make a portfolio to get hired by these people. So I made this portfolio 
I don't think I have it with me, or I would. Oh wait, maybe I do actually. Oh my god, I do. Is this nice. it? By yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. This for is anyone uh, who's listening on audio. Please tune into YouTube if you can, because you're gonna miss out on some like really juicy stuff. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so okay, so what I did is I when I when I uh, was making this portfolio, you know, I thought to myself, I'm gonna. I'm going to make a, a portfolio that targets, you know, D&D and Magic the Gathering, but more so Magic the Gathering. So what I did, I'm going to try to, like, show these as best as I can. These are, this is 2012, right? Like, I think I started making these in 2011 while I was still in school. But but if you look right here, right, it's it's an image, and then I made fake Magic cards, like, to go with it, right? Like and I Yeah, kind of. But I think the idea was, in, like, a portfolio sense, right, was, like, how can I show my artwork that I want to get hired to do? How can I show my portfolio in a context that an art director could like really understand, right? Like, why don't I just put my work on an actual product that they get hired, that they hire you to then make, like, you know, to make the company money. And and that's where I, you know, basically just came up with the idea of like fake magic cards. I mean, well, I can't take full credit for it. I, I mean, I, uh, my, my friend, uh, a college buddy of mine, Dieter, Dieter Miller, he, uh, you know, he had kind of started doing stuff like this too, but, but, you know, it's something, it's an idea that me, him and, and one other guy, uh, you know, kind of like played around with, with our college thesis. And I, I kind of took it to like a really polished, uh, sorry, it's kind of got some glare on it. I kind of took it, you know, to like a really polished level. And, uh, I remember still living in Michigan. I went to Indianapolis, Indiana. So like the next state over drove there, stayed with a friend, went to this convention called Gen Con. And I, uh, basically had this portfolio and, you know, they, they liked it. They magic the gathering was doing portfolio reviews there, or I guess wizards was, and they said, yeah, this is great. Let's hire you. And they did. And, you know, they even liked the like the fake work I did so much that they're like, we're going to buy like the publishing rights to these specific cards. So they gave me like, you know, a, 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 like a publishing fee. It was like a little less than getting commissioned at the time. But also man, when I was like a broke 20 something kid, I was like, this is the great like I'm, I've made it like this is the career of my life. You know, like, I was just like, this is the greatest moment of my life. Like, absolutely. Like, you know, I, I never had a client before and everyone had this sort of like rule book like a, a i'm using air quotes people have this like assumption right at least the the back then the community would say like you don't just get magic the gathering like when you when you first come out of school or when you're first like learning how to be an illustrator you have to like go through these stepping stones of like you're not good enough yet but like if you can work on these you know lower tier jobs right that pay a little bit less like eventually you'll you'll reach the dream but i was able to like get past all that cuz my work was just like strong enough at the time and you know just get hired to to like do the thing so it was cool to kind of like jump a few steps i guess in the process i mean that should tell you that like you know, not everyone's experience in this thing is universal. And like, despite the rules people might say, it's like people are sort of on their own journey and it's not all this linear thing and everyone kind of has a different way of doing things. But anyway, I, yeah. So the first two years was like just magic cards and even like Applebot, this Japanese company was doing uh, like a mobile game uh, on a, on a, what was it? It was uh it was called the legend of the cryptids and galaxy saga. And like, they were both like, you know, very like, you know, Korea, I think the, the design aesthetic was Korean, but it was just, it was very like, you know, high end, like super detailed, super polished, like, you know, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It almost looks like splash art, like vertical splash art, you know, but like even more rendered than something that like League of Legends would come up with. And that's like, you know, that was a whole thing. That was a whole moment in time, I feel like, between like 2012 and 2013. And again, all magic artists working on that stuff. And if you go back in time, you'll you'll find all of it. It's It was like a very interesting moment in time. But yeah, first two years was illustration. And then a friend of mine who I went to school with, had gotten hired as uh, he was a lead and then eventually an art director over at Xbox. And he was working on a stylized game and he remembered me from school and he hired me and one other person. And that, that is what made me move out to the Pacific Northwest out to Washington, because that's where Microsoft is like mostly based. Uh, and so, yeah, I got into AAA games that way. And then after, let's see a year or two on that, 
I had a, a brief moment. <laughs> this is funny. I had a, a brief moment in time where I did mobile games uh, for a, a company called Glue Mobile, and there they do like they did the uh, the celebrity games like the Kim Kardashian game, right? Like they 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 have all these like celebrities that they do these games with, and the, the Kim Kardashian game was such a success. And I think mostly that's due to like when it was released was when the Kardashians were like at their peak relevance, you know, like the world had this fascination with like the celebrity, the yeah, enigma I of the Kardashians. 14, 13 back then, so I don't recall anything, but. Oh my, I, well, I, at least here, here, in, I don't know uh, where you were at, but over here, it was like, they were all over TV. Everyone was like obsessed with the Kardashians. So it's like, that's the only thing I can think of as to why this game did so well, but it did so well that glue was like, let's do that with, a bunch of celebrities so they got the rights to like taylor swift britney spears and then the game that i worked on for a year was the Nicki minaj game <laughs> and that is such a funny thing to talk about because like it's just so not what my portfolio is and like no one when i tell that to people they're like they're genuinely shocked they're like you you did what and i'm like yeah sorry yeah, it's like i mean in the yeah. span of like a couple of minutes, we came from Sydney to Nicki Minaj. So I guess I could <laughs> yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's well, and that should be, if anything, that should be just like a, a, a uh, that should be illustrative of the reality that sometimes you just do what you have to do, <laughs> you know. And in my case, those were my opportunities, and like it was a fun opportunity. It was a cool experience. It was interesting. It was kind of crazy working with Nicki too. Her feedback was interesting uh and but but yeah you know and the, the the studio was great the people i'm still friends with a lot of the people that i worked with there but anyway little brief time there also spent some time afterwards in casino games which is something that isn't really you know on my resume or my portfolio but i spent about four years working remotely for this company uh called gimme games and they're based in in like the uh the georgia area like sort of like atlanta and um you know, they make casino games. It's the digital slot machines that, you know, you see like with the big physical cabinets, you know, in, in any casino, go to any casino in the world. And you've probably seen like one or two games that maybe I like did something for in some way, but I did a lot of the art, a lot of the gameplay art and a lot of like the packaging for it too. But, but then where I really started to come into my own was like 2016. I, you know, while I'm working this casino games job, it's it's so it like it honestly if it, it was so like not creatively taxing for me like it was so like I just had a lot of energy and bandwidth after work every time I would work you know the day it's like I barely did any like crazy work like it wasn't the same as like the triple A grind it was a lot easier in terms of like workload so I just started drawing stuff that I found interesting in my own free time and that's where like like if you go to uh art station there's like a collection of drawings really old drawings and i think one of them is literally it's just a bunch of weird fleshy creature designs you know which is completely different from what i usually do but what i found by uh doing these personal style experiments you know starting to lean more into like the cell shaded anime you know almost like moebius-esque sort of side of my brain is like this is the stuff i actually really enjoy doing and I guess I never realized until, you know, I went through this weird loop of like, you know, I did a bunch of stuff that isn't related to this kind of art. You know, I did a lot of high fantasy stuff. I did a lot of like really polished illustration work. I worked on some, you know, very realistic stuff, some really stylized stuff. Like I kind of had to try out a little bit of, a little bit of everything to realize like, at least art wise, I enjoy the weird stuff, the stylized stuff a lot more. Um, and I think, too, you know, if you spend a lot of time in AAA games, because I hadn't worked on any TV or film stuff at this point, when you spend a lot of time in games, uh, you know, especially coming up in, like, Washington, you know, I was surrounded by, like, people from Valve and 343, and there was people at, like, Treyarch, so, like, Call of Duty. There was people on just a lot of, like, very real – Bungie, right? It was all, like, realistic stuff you know there was like an element of whimsy and stylization to it but a lot of this stuff you know i was just surrounded by all these like triple a badasses who made like really high 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 caliber high polished stuff but not everyone was really doing like you know like cell shaded like simple anime type stuff i so i i think maybe i just like i out of frustration right uh out of just feeling like i was in this homogenized pool of of art styles 
uh, not so much like the games and stuff, but like just if you look at like Art Station, for example, right? It felt like at least at that time in like 2016, it felt like if you look at the mosaic, it felt like everyone was sort of doing the same thing. It's all very well done, but it just didn't interest me. So I started making stuff that was just different. And then I started to lean into this art direction, this this idea of like, what if you, you could have a new thesis for your portfolio? What would it be? And I was like, what if you did something different? Which isn't exactly the smartest idea because, you know, trends, the thing that most people are trying to like make work catered towards, that's what you get hired for, right? Like, so if you make this really unmarketable portfolio, it will be very unique and it will be very different, but it won't necessarily guarantee you many opportunities because a lot of people are hiring for this thing that just isn't as popular. It's cool and it's different. And a lot of times the difference is the amount of how different it is, is what makes it cool and interesting. But if it's really specialized, you know, like you have like a very narrow window of of employment opportunity or more narrow, I should say, at least back in 2016, that's really how it felt. But I said, fuck it, I'm just going to like do the thing because I don't care. And I just want to like make stuff that I enjoy while I work this, you know, other job, this casino games job. Um, And that's how I actually pay the bills. So I had this sort of opportunity to like do something that was sort of like uncharted territory and not exactly safe and a little risky, but I, I, I'd be happy doing it. And, you know, when enough people online start responding to it, like this is, this is better than anything I've seen you do. Keep doing this. You get the re- positive reinforcement. You want to like keep going with it. And um, when enough positive feedback comes by, it just, yeah, you just, you just lean into it. I mean, I, I think what I, what I really started leaning into it is when people would tell me, you know, I, I'd buy a book of this. So that's when I thought, okay, maybe you got something on your hands here. So, it, you know, the whole, this formed a, a book project called Numinous, which is like a lot of the personal work you see on my portfolio, uh, at least, at least in the, uh, the art station area, but it's, you know, and uh, what that is, is that's basically, I don't know if I have a copy of the book because I, I had a very limited print run and it's not even a finished book. It was like a very scaled down test print by it's probably like a a quarter of what I would consider like a proper size for like a book one. But basically this weird style experiment led to, you know, uh, like a narrative idea, like where, where I, I started working with a friend of mine, my friend Brent, really cool guy. He, he's, he's a writer and, you know, we would start to co-write, like a narrative idea behind this. Like it it began as like art that needed some direction and that informed the writing. And then it becomes, you know, the process we worked at when we were working on this book was like this back and forth of like, sometimes the art informs the writing, sometimes the writing informs the art. But initially, you know, you had to figure out how to like write, write like a logical story behind a logical, sorry, not illogical, a logical story behind like this sort of like pile of like cool art that didn't really have like, it had meaning, but like nothing you could really like describe in words or nothing that felt like sequential. And, you know, we started making it sequential and like we made it, we made it this whole book and, and it almost became this metaphor, right? The story behind it became this metaphor about like, it's like a, a, a traveler that crash lands on a distant planet you know, they don't really like know where they're at. They start interacting with all this indigenous wildlife and it becomes almost like a field journal rather than just like a comic book where it's like they're like how Leonardo da Vinci had those like medical illustrations or he had like illustrations of plants and things that he would like see in nature, right? Like sort of like documenting real life encounters. So like a field journal, it's like, what if like you had a journal of this traveler character and like the world that they're interacting with. And really what it comes down to as a story is because it's still not fully resolved, but it's still an ongoing project. I got busy with other stuff, but the idea there is like uh, the traveler you could say is a metaphor for myself. Like I am the traveler. I found myself in this weird world that I didn't expect to be in, you know, AKA the weird creatures and designs. And it turns out that it's like, this is like, this is the home, like where the traveler is meant to be. Like, it's just a metaphor for me, like find my own creative voice. Like, you know, it took me traveling around to a bunch of places that weren't home, AKA the jobs that don't necessarily interest me, but I need them because of money. Uh, And like getting to the right thing, which is the weird thing. Like that's, that's my identity as an artist. Like, and I, I've, I've accepted it and I've leaned into it and people really enjoy it. So it's like, you know, that's, I'm the traveler basically long story short. But 
when when all that art starts to get shown around, you know, is when all the clients too who didn't necessarily like want to work with me before start coming out, you know, and you know, you mentioned Love, Death, and Robots. Like that's a great example. Like I feel like around 2019, you know, yeah, Netflix reaches out and they're like, you know, we've got this idea for you know Love, Death, and Robots. It was supposed to be the second season, but remember, 2019 was before the pandemic. So pandemic really shuffled up a lot of stuff in the world, and they. They basically said, like, we're looking for, like, a, a Moebius, Moebiesque sort of style of artist, which I'm certainly not the only one, right? But they were interested in me, and they said, you know, we we have this idea. It's – the episode, by the way, is actually season three, and it's the very pulse of the machine, which is the very Moebiesque style uh, episode. It's it's literally supposed to be a love letter to like the aesthetic and the, the art artistic influence of Mobius. But basically two female astronauts crash land on a planet. One of them dies and her consciousness is absorbed into the planet. And the brief I was given with is how does the planet that now has like the soul and the consciousness of a human communicate to the, the one that has survived, right? Like, what does that look like? Cause it's not, you know, it's not, there's no terrain. There's no, terraformed atmosphere it's just like a moon it's the moon of io actually and like it's just rock like it's barren rock how do you how does a planet communicate to a human so that's so i just did a ton of viz dev on that and it, you know it ended up going in a few directions and the episode's really cool though it's fantastic and the director emily dean she's amazing she she's you know she's a blur director but works with netflix and a bunch of other people on a bunch of cool stuff and you know, basically, yeah, she, she's been on record a few times, like, and been interviewed that, like, yes, this is a love letter to Moebius. And, you know, I just wanted to tell this very surreal story. And it's very interesting. But that was one of the first experiences where I really got to, like, just go Robbie on a thing and make it weird and make it interesting and lean into the style. And since then, you know, it's been a lot of that kind of work. It's I've worked on more stuff that gets canceled than gets greenlit. That's just part of, like, you know, sort of being in the pitch phase of stuff. Like there are sort of two phases, right. To like a lot of development cycles, whether it's like games or TV and film, but I'll, I'll use games as in this analogy, like there's pre-production and there's production and pre-production in my opinion is when it's just like the most creatively juicy. Cause like the art style hasn't been set. Nothing's there's no rules. It's basically just draw a bunch of stuff, like build up the world. Like we're looking for like those, like, creative lightning strike moments of just like here's the thing it's awesome but you know you, you got to find it first so you might end up drawing a lot of stuff that doesn't look good or wasn't necessarily drawn very well but like when the ideas hit the ideas hit and that's where you get to be your most creative it's it's not until production that you're like here here is the process here are the rules we can't really deviate too much you know stuff changes in, in production obviously everything changes until it's out the door finally but like yeah, for me, I ended up finding myself in so many pitch or pre-production situations, right? Blue sky phases, whether it was like a quick pitch deck for some for a game that might not get made, or it's literally you're on a you know a job right now and like you're just gonna be like doing pre-production work and like building up this world for this new IP. It's it's I find myself doing a lot of that uh, in recent years. Um, some of it's out, some of it isn't, you know, like I worked on, I worked on at Lucasfilm uh, animation on the bad batch, which is, you know, if anyone knows that show, it's a spinoff of the clone wars, very uh, animated sort of style. That's again, you know, getting to touch cool IPs with like a, a, an art style. That's more like, you know, more, more mine, I suppose it's, it's really not that show necessarily. It's a little bit more, it's a different kind of art style, but stylized art, star Wars, right. That's a good way to describe it. Um, and a few other things, uh, I'm trying to think of what else, you know, a bunch of it actually, I can't talk about, but like the stuff that's out is out and you can see it. So like, yes, love death and robots, you know, the bad badge of star Wars. Um, I know too, uh, we kind of mentioned also, there is these musician relationships, right? And that's, that's social media mostly. Like, I don't think those, uh, opportunities come because you know people look at your resume right like a a musician right like i'll use the band tool that i worked with in 2019 
like they are they're artists that love artwork right like especially adam jones who's like the guitarist and he's sort of the art director behind everything he he actually if you can believe this he actually goes to lightbox expo in uh los angeles uh because he's a local out here right and he loves art and i i think i believe because 2019 was the first lightbox and i was doing a demo at arts art stations booth with like anthony jones and a few other people and um I, I don't know if it was there that he saw my work first or if it was just the internet, but at some point in like spring, no, it was not spring. It was like, it was fall of uh, 2019. He, he reached out to me and said, the band's getting back together for the 2019 fear inoculum tour. And, you know, like we want you to do some, some posters for some stops. And it was, it was awesome. I, you know, had never in a million years thought like when I was going to school, drawing door handles for minivans, I never once thought like, Oh yeah, you're going to be doing some tool posters, you know. But again, I think because other than like being sort of present on social media, it's just like you leaned into your thing, the thing you really should be doing, right? Your style of art. It's not a safe bet, but it ended up becoming the safest bet because, you know, opportunities like that showed up, opportunities like Star Wars and Netflix, like the really interesting stuff that's sort of like, you know, I've been I've been blessed to work on is due mostly in part, I feel like, to other than like opportunities, right? Which a lot of it is who you know, but it, it's it's just like yeah, it, 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 it's like I I leaned in a direction I'm supposed to, and uh, the good stuff started happening. So it's it's you know, it's a combination of a few circumstances, but yeah, like yeah, Tool in 2019 did some posters for them. Smashing Pumpkins did like a poster for them in like 22. Worked with the DJ Dead Mouse, the Canadian DJ Dead Mouse, back in uh, 2021, uh, and we actually met through NFTs, which is an interesting conversation. But you know, we can shelve that for another time. But but you know, I did participate a little bit. It was an interesting facet of creativity. It's not really a thing anymore. But you know, I checked it out like a bunch of other people did. Met him through that. Ended up working with him. <laughs> let's see, in Miami, uh, in like the summer i feel like it was either the summer or or the fall of that year too so yeah you know uh sort of i i don't know i i, I definitely my path hasn't been linear like it's been very up and down and varied and you know it's never it's not just to say it's all been a consistent smooth ride since right like between all the circumstances of the world like the film strikes last year or like just you know, economic conditions, you know, like where, where industries are receiving, you know, money from investors and and where they aren't and, you know, downsizing of workforce and even like the hot button topic of AI. It's like all these things have affected everyone, even people at like the absolute top of their game, right? Like seeing Craig Mullins on Twitter asking for like work, like, you know, like anyone is susceptible to like recession or like just world, the world circumstances. So anyway, that's just to say that it's like, you know, I'm still busy. I'm still working on a bunch of stuff. You know, I, I, I at a startup right now, a Netty startup called Jar of Sparks. And that's, you know, that's very, very fun gig, you know, can't talk about it like necessarily, but just like, you know, working with some really talented folks and working on something cool. And, you know, when it comes out, it comes out. So we'll see when that happens. But other than that, you know, my DMs are always open on, on, on the socials. So, you know, occasionally something cool comes by, uh, and yeah, I don't know. That's sort of what I've been up to in, over the last 12 years. Damn. I think <laughs> I'll go on record and say this is the longest, actually well-detailed answer to the first question of the podcast. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. I love it. There's so much to unpack here right now. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel I definitely <laughs> glazed over some stuff, if you can believe it, but we would be here all day So because I could just – go forever but anyway i'll let you take the reins yeah, no, no it's fine man. it's fine um about like um just want to quickly mention something you said you went to college finished college just a uh, second uh-huh. damn my i nearly sneezed but yeah it's not coming jesus uh, it's, it's you that, hate you that? Know, when you have a sneeze but it doesn't come and then yeah and then it'll come like when you don't want it to and it'll come exactly. way so fast I just, i'm yep. just on, on alert to try to mute my mic no worries, no worries. Yeah, whatever. Let, let me just continue. Uh-huh. If it happens, I'll edit it later. I, don't worry, like headphone listeners. Um, 
Well, speaking of you, you mentioned that you finished college in 2012, right? Yeah, yeah, I graduated in 2012. So uh, about that, sometimes I always ask this stuff, you know, um, from guests. You know, I always point out this stuff, um, these comparisons. I was 15 at the time. Mm-hmm. And like these things are really freaky to me. They're, like there was this other like guest I had. Like he said he started using Unreal Engine in 1998. And I just paused for a second. I was like... I was one year old back then. You know? Yeah, that's that's crazy. When you put things in the timeline, you realize, wow. You know? Or oh, there yeah. was this other time, like I was just messing with one of my friends and I was like, he's like five, six years younger than me. And I realized, wait, when you were in first grade, Skyrim came out. And, I was, <laughs> and yeah, stuff well, like this freak you out, right? I, I, I don't know the exact... <laughs> What was it, 99 that The Matrix came out? And, like, I don't remember how many... I'm really bad at math. That's why I draw pictures. But, like, I remember years ago when someone said, The Matrix is now 20 years old. And I was like, holy shit. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. was... I don't even know. Is 99. Do the math. You know, it's it's 2024. But, like, yeah. Yeah. Or, like, how about this? I am 36. And I was 16 when I first opened up Photoshop, which means I've been using Photoshop for 20 years. That makes you feel old. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think I was using like Photoshop 2 or something like, you know, and like a bamboo stylus. <laughs> uh, all right. So here's an yeah. interesting question I can ask you. So we're kind of 10 years apart, right? So mm-hmm. if you could, you know, what advice do you have for your, for the 26-year-old version of yourself if you could talk to him right now? I feel, I feel like we need to go even younger than 26 because when I was 26, I was two years into the art thing, right? So like – like because, you know, artist Robbie – I mean, well, what I would give 26-year-old Robbie would be like, you know, hey, stop this like – this whole thing about like this is the artist I think I need to be because like that's what's popular online, right? And at the time, what I saw was like – highly rendered highly polished like you got to be like brad rigney and you got to render the shit out of everything and it's got to look really good and like that's what good art is right it's about you know fidelity and like the level of finish and polish what i would have what i would tell that artist right that 26 year old artist is like hey just draw what you like to draw like and it turns out that it's not going to be the most popular thing but it will be very different and like that will be its own you know, rewarding thing. That's what I would say to 26 year old Robbie. What I would say to an even younger version of Robbie would be like, like stop messing around and like take the art thing seriously. Because I think about how, how bad I was in the beginning. And I was bad. A lot of people go, a lot of people are like, no way. And I'm like, dude, I, if I showed you my college entrance portfolio, you'd be like, I can't believe they let you in. (laughs) So like, you know, I, I would have like, I think about how long it took me to get to the skill I'm at now. And which isn't even something I'm satisfied with. I want to, you know, there's so many things I want to improve, but like, I would tell, you know, an even younger version of Robbie, like we'll say like 20 year old Robbie, I feel like anytime before I got into like the whole art thing seriously, which I feel like 20 or 21 is when I like really started taking it seriously. I would tell 18 year old Robbie, like just start practicing right now. And like, these are the things you need to like, not be doing anymore that you need to just like ignore, which, you know, a a lot of it was just like people discouraging me from like, you know, pursuing art, but it was also, I don't know. I just, I, I, I didn't take it seriously. I didn't realize like the level of commitment it would take. You know, I, I just thought people were just good at things and there was no like practicing or honing your craft, you know, like, like I, I, King Jung Gi might be like a bad example of this, but like he's on, he, he had been on record for a long time before he passed away of saying like, I'm just incredibly disciplined. I think he's probably, more of a special case, more of an outlier, but he was incredibly disciplined. It's true. Like there's no denying it. So like, you know, when you look at someone who was that skilled at what they did, you know, and you just realize they donated, excuse me, dedicated so much of their life to it. It's like, it, there takes a degree of commitment and it's something that most people don't understand until they're like living that life, that reality of like, I am an artist and like, I, you know, if I'm going to compete right professionally with people that are at this level, I need to get to that too. And, you know, it's not just as simple as like, well, you know, like I'll figure it out. It's like, no, 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 you have to like, 
start training now. So like I, you know, I, I didn't take art seriously in that way until, you know, at least like my early twenties, but I, I, I wish I'd started earlier because there's a few people, you know, who, who I, I couldn't afford to go to art high school or anything like that as a kid, but there are friends of mine who, who, who did, and they, I don't know if they really took it as seriously as they could have, but man, if I had been given that opportunity, I probably would have really leaned into it, you know? So I, I don't know. I just, that's all just to say without rambling too much that like, you know, younger Robbie, like start taking it more seriously immediately. Uh, so you can like, you know, not have to play the catch up game and be even further ahead than you would be in, you know, 10, 15 years, whatever from now. And also just make the art you want to make because, anything else is like a form of settling you you know all the all everyone feels like they have to be something i shouldn't say everyone but a lot of people at least when they're younger they feel like they need to fit into a certain a certain creative facet or a certain like description of artist because that is that that is measurable in terms of success right like if you make this you know you will get this kind of result like financially career wise whatever but it's like but do you actually enjoy doing it you know, you put environments, you put characters, you put guns, you put, you have your whole checklist of here, here's my portfolio to get hired. But it's like, do you actually enjoy all everything in here? Because if you enjoy character design, but your environments are actually stronger and that's what you get hired to do because you felt like it needed to be in your portfolio, you're doing environment art now and you're not, you're not doing the character thing you want to do because you, you thought you, you thought you had to do it. And you know, I like that's just like doesn't sound like a career. It sounds like a job. So if you want a, a real career, right, like something that you love to do, like make sure it's something you love to do. Right. And and only put that out in the world. And that's what that's what you'll eventually get hired to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And um, on the topic of, you know, works, there's, you know, something about your art session that I need to ask you is that's just tickled my curiosity a bit. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's a title of. um some of your posts, uh, it's kind of funny, yeah, but I knew that was, that was kind of made me chuckle. Your mom part one and your mom part two. <laughs> yeah, yep. Was more of your mom's book book club friends. She has so many friends and, and the drawings <laughs> are just really, so yeah. really... Like, dude, I have a question. Like, uh, do you, like, you know, use substances to get inspiration? I'm just, I'm just going to leave No, 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 I don't. I don't. But I've been asked this by a lot of people. I don't. I genuinely yeah. don't. I, I've i tried now and I'm completely like uh, ineffective and like useless as an artist when it comes to like, yeah, like even like marijuana, for example, right? Like, no, which isn't marijuana. even like a I mean, taboo thing, right? I know you're talking more like, you know, LSD or like yeah. shrooms or something. All that stuff is super fun, right? It just doesn't make me a better artist in that moment. Maybe it'll inform my ideas like later on, but no, I, 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 I haven't really, all of that like came from, well, I have a few theories as to like, why is it so weird when you just go full tilt in one direction and growing up in like, uh, you know, like the, the sort of like Detroit metropolitan area, right? Like, like any city, there are good spots and bad spots in Detroit because of how much, sort of like hard surface inspiration you can find there. And I mean, in sort of a, the last of us aesthetic, right? Because there's all these like power, uh, power plants. There's all these like, you know, manufacturing plants for like industrial, you know, equipment, right? Whether it's like vehicles, boats, planes, cars, whatever, you know, that are, that are decommissioned now, right? They're sort of rusting. They're like urban decay now at this point like it's not the whole city but there's a lot of like we'll call it like mechanical skeletal remains of like a time period that you can find all over at least when i was in that area you know and i think seeing like a lot of the anatomy of like machinery right like the rusted out hood of a car right and you're seeing sort of like the engine bay and the pistons and the the crankshaft and all this like hard surface and and anatomical detail i think a lot of that translated into like the work that i do now right like a lot of it's like you know at least like the personal work you see right a lot of it's like very organic i call it flesh tech right like where it's it's sort of like fleshy it's sort of techy it's just like a a, you know silly little term i came up with but like when i think about you know this flesh tech inspiration like where did it come from why is it so weird it's like my only explanation is like it's through observing a lot of those like 
you know, man-made mechanical parts mixed in with like foliage and, and, you know, trees and, and all kinds of stuff that's sort of like overgrowing and growing into and like becoming one with like, you know, the urban decay, right? Like the, the skeletal remains of like all these like, you know, machine plants and stuff. Like, I think, I think a lot of it is just that I, there, there's some, there's one artist, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of who, who it was, but like, he is a very colorful palette like a very colorful palette. He does a lot of environment concept art, um, really popular. I can't remember his name, but he uh, supposedly he had grown up on, uh, on like a, a cargo, like shipping boat or like had seen a lot of cargo shipping boats when he was a child. And they have all those multicolored, you know, cargo, cargo compartments. Right. Like, and, and I think, like, I think that the idea there is that like, Oh, like those, those uh like splashes of color right in sort of like square patterns like that sort of influenced his like internal color palette or at least his his design tendencies like you know naturally same thing with like moebius right like he spent so much time in uh the mexican desert and it's like you look at a lot of like the 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 work of the work that he's done where it's like flat open you know desert landscapes with like you know monumental crystal uh, you know, architecture or something. And, and what you see is you see a lot of like flat desert plain. And like, again, I think that art, that choice is influenced by his real world experience, like in, in those, you know, deserts in Mexico, like, you know, supposedly this is all stuff that I, I don't know if it's like officially like on the record, but like, I've heard a lot of, you know, these kinds of stories. It makes you wonder like, what about like someone like Geiger? Like, what did he like what interest did he have outside of art and how did that influence his art? Right. Cause he's got a very specific style, but that's all just to say that it's like, no, no drugs, but like life experiences, probably something to do with that. Oh yeah, definitely. And like, honestly, like, you know, out of all the works that I've seen, you know, from you, if I had to pick, you know, a couple of, you know, favorites, I, one of my, from, from some of one of your oldest works, it's titled Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. I I hope I pronounced that oh, right. Oh yeah, the ver- the super vertical. Yeah, uh, I yeah. really mm-hmm. like that. And also the uh, the archivist one from your like fleshy kind of an you know, gory. Works. Oh, numinous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy with the scrolls coming down, the parchment on the back, and he's got yeah. the tendrils, and he's like feeding I data on top of the wood. That looks sick, actually. That oh, looks thanks, sick. thanks. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, that's, that's all from the, the book of Numinous, right? That's all mm-hmm. just sort of, you know, what are these weird creatures and, uh, you know, what would you even, how would you even describe them? I mean, yeah, creatures is a good word, you know, deities, beings, otherworldly creatures. It's like, you know, what, just like put, put it in a field journal. Like how would you, if you could like visually describe what this creature you've encountered is like, what would it look like on paper? You know? Mm. and uh yeah yeah that's it's it's just a lot of weird stuff man i the short answer to all this is i just think it looks cool <laughs> but like you got to look into it like but why because if you ask most artists like it's so funny listening to interviews from like really famous artists like like i remember like one interview with geiger where he's like describing the xenomorph and he's literally just like uh, it's got the like a sunglasses and like he's describing the like the like translucent uh, like carapace shape that goes over the uh, the skull, right? But he's described it as sunglasses. Like most people who had only ever seen his work would probably be like, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd think of a much longer, more nuanced, like, you know, take on, on his work and like the meaning behind it. But he, you know, basically just said like, oh, it just looks like this thing and I just thought it looked cool. And it's like, yeah, I think that's what a lot of artists are thinking in the moment, you know, but it's maybe subconsciously there's like way more thought and a lot more layered things happening there but yeah short answer versus long answer <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> there's you know so much to dive deep into but one thing i also like you know that is kind of you know related to this topic is that i need to ask is in general whenever you want to work on a new of course you know it differs from professional piece and personal piece but you know if you if you could answer this question on both sides you know that'd be awesome how does it? How does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a new piece or project? Like, I mean, what does the structure of a pipeline usually look like? You know, of course, both for professional work and personal work. 
I mean, it depends on. I mean, a lot of it's just like it, 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 it varies, you know, it depends on what the task is, you know, like if I'm working on something, I've, I've been leaning more into like, you know, other tools in the last year or so, like 3D, for example, right? I just learned Blender last year. And this year, I've been trying to wrap my mind more around something like ZBrush, you know, and I'm, I'm at a point where I don't, you know, I, I still I'm say I'm still like 90, 95% you know, 2D, right? Hand-drawn, hand-painted, you know, just really rely on your fundamental knowledge. But I, uh, you know, it, it, it depends, right? Like if I'm, if I'm, let's see. Okay. For example, I'll compare the, that ride view project, right? That car based project to something like something from numinous, right? So like, with the ride view thing, right, it's pretty defined what we were trying to do. Uh, like, so to describe the project, right? Three people interested in anime, interested in 90s Japanese, like JDM car culture, right? So like Japanese, you know, like the legends, right? The Supras, you know, the uh, Honda S2000s, the NSXs, you know, wh whatever, Skylines, you name it. You know, we basically wanted to merge, you know, Gundam, right? And specifically the RX-78 too, right? Which is a very like well-known, it's sort of the grandpa Gundam, very well-known Gundam with the Acura NSX, you know, this Japanese uh, 90s car culture icon. And because the two things are so sort of concrete already, right? In that case, we're sort of passing around 3D assets, right? Like, you know, a base model of what the NSX looks like. And then I'm sort of eyeballing, you know, like what, like what, what are the sort of like the design motifs of the of the, the ARC-78 too, like between form language and maybe color palette. And then you sort of try to find ways to implement that into the car. And you try to keep the car as recognizable as possible because you're this is, this is like an homage project. You're trying to pay tribute and respect to both subjects without like completely like, you know, l losing one or the other. So, you know, in that case, right, you know, again, you know, like, it, it's like I, I I'm not designing something for numinous, right? Where it's like we have no idea what this looks like because nothing like it exists in reality. So I just need to do like silhouettes, black and white silhouettes, you know, to just find interesting shapes, and then eventually like draw on top of that a little bit more until something, you know, sort of solidifies with something like something like a little bit more understood and a little less nebulous, like the the car project, right? You're sort of, you know, taking pre-existing things and you're sort of mashing them together in an interesting and effective way. But with something like Numinous, right? Or in this case, a lot of the, the projects that I get hired to do, right? Like, again, like the Love, Death and Robots thing, it's like a lot of times, right? Like, especially with something like Love, Death and Robots, you know, there's some visual aid, like a mood board or something that the client will give you and say, hey, like, here's kind of what we like. We like the colors of this thing. And here, <coughs> excuse me, here are some moments in cinema, you know, from these TV shows or whatever that we also think are interesting. And we, but, but mostly it's, it's a, it's a, just a giant wall of text, right? It's just writing. Like, you know, he, here's the idea. Here's the pitch. <clears throat> we need you to visualize this. What does it look like? And when something like that happens, a lot of times you're, you know, if, if I have no idea what I'm doing whatsoever, I will just literally just draw the thing out like on a, on a piece of white paper, right? It might be just clean, direct lines. It might be like, you know, again, silhouettes, right? Black and white uh, shapes, you know? And the cool thing about silhouettes, like it's so basic, but like, when you start out like on a macro level, right, you're you're not like focused on like detail. You're not focused on like anything really like nuanced. It's more just like what's the big picture here, which a lot of times that is the only amount of information you're given. It just won't be, you know, visual. It'll be written like here's here's like a big, you know, thousand foot view of like what we want. And then, you know, sometimes your art needs to sort of be that too. It's zoomed out, right? And then you zoom in and, and refine it. And in this case, you know, again, with the Love, Death, and Robots thing, it's just a lot of like, you know, quick, loose, simple, big, big shapes, you know. And then eventually you dive in and you you refine it more and more. It's, you kind of got to start start broad and then, and then narrow it. And I think too, when you're doing something like Numinous or something like, Love Death and Robots, like anything that is like really un, undefined, right? It's very, it's very blue sky. Could be anything. 
showing as much variety in the beginning is great. I mean, like I, I, I will try to. It's almost like I've I've seen some drawing exercises, right, where people will just have a bunch of shapes on a piece of paper and they all look different. It's like one of those drawing games where you pass around a drawing to each other and you try to finish the thing or, or add to it. But in this case, right, it's a big, big sheet. There's like really vertical shapes. Maybe they're all like circles or ovals, right? But some of the ovals are super vertical. Some are super wide. Some are really low. Some are like kind of warped this way. Like nothing really looks the same. Everything's a little bit different or very different. And then from there, you're sort of like carving out, you know, the more nuanced shapes, the more nuanced information. It's, I try to approach like design in the beginning like that. It's like, give as, give as many options as you can and make sure they are as different from each other as, you, as they possibly can be. And then, you know, once you've found that limit, right, once you've gone too far, you can just pull it back in. A lot of times, I feel like that's that's the preference for a lot of people, right? Like working with, like one client I've worked with for a while, ArenaNet, right? They, they, they're that's that's a big part of their model, at least on like the creature design team is like, find the limit, you know, like go as like go too far because once we know what too much is, we can always bring it back. But if you don't ever quite reach that point, you're going to be sort of like gently pushing a thing like in that direction for far too long. It's like, just find it in the beginning, like go as crazy as you can in the beginning. And then, you know, from there you can just bring it back in. But, but yeah, it took me a long time to learn those kinds of approaches. I, my first, my first time, uh, it was like my first or second day, uh, at Xbox, you know, I, I didn't even have my like Cintiq set up and I, I had just like printing printer paper, you know, and everyone's using like 3d and like in Photoshop. And I'm just sitting at this desk with like, a stack of like Xerox paper and I'm just drawing things and they're all terrible. Like none of them. Cause remember I went from like, I'm an illustrator to like, I'm a concept artist and I did not understand like the rules of shape distribution and, you know, detail versus areas of rest, right? The whole 30, 70 idea, it gets preached a lot. Like, you know, like large areas rest, large, small areas of detail or vice versa, right? Just like visual hierarchy. I didn't understand any of this stuff. And I just was drawing things that all kind of looked similar. And, you know, I, that experience is where like, you know, the concept artists there were like, you need to make everything way different. Like, don't be afraid to like draw past like the canvas on the page, you know, like just make, just go crazy. Like you, you're an artist, you can, you can draw anything. Like, why are you being so safe and, and reserved with your choices? Go crazy. Like, does it look ridiculous? Are you afraid it's going to look ridiculous? Maybe it'll look silly, but you're not going to know until you draw it. So just like, make the thing as crazy as you can. And yeah, it took me a long time to get there, but, but that's all just to say that it's like the approach is different depending on the task. And sometimes things are very nebulous and you don't know what a thing could look like. And that's where I just sort of reach into that bag of knowledge we just talked about. And I try to, you know, take as many ideas as I can. And then sometimes it's more defined. Like we know what the NSX looks like. We know what a Gundam looks like. Just put the two together in some interesting way. So sometimes it's a little less, you know, confusing. And sometimes there are more rules, right? Depending on the client. Like, but fortunately, most of my clients nowadays, uh, they're, they trust me. They're very like, we know we, we hired you for a reason. We know what you can do, make it cool. In the beginning though, when I was a little less proven and didn't have as much, I don't know what you want to call it, street cred or, or whatever. Like, you know, yeah, definitely. Like I was a wrist and art directors were like, this is what I want. Just make the thing. Cause I can't draw it. And like, that's not, you know, I guess the definition of being a creative. Right. So like I've, I've had to do both. Right. It depends on the client, but these days it's, there's a lot more trust, I think. All right. Pretty interesting mm -hmm. story. And well, speaking of, you know, working in the industry that now this one is going to be a really interesting question, you know, in my opinion, um, throughout this episode, you talked about your experience working on games, movies, you know, I guess cinema production, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. 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 And me working with musicians, like you've been all over the place, man. And so from all these experiences, you know, what are some unique features about working in each category, you know, mm. like in terms of experience, of course. Yeah, I you know actually so I can think of some specific 
some specificities when it comes to like each each experience, right? With with games, because the cycle seems to be a lot longer to develop a thing, there can be a lot more changes in direction, right? There can be a lot, whether it's like leadership or it's like just here's the new direction we're taking, the the art, the aesthetic, whatever. You can you can, you have a little bit more time, I feel like, in games to work on stuff. It's not to say that it doesn't also go really fast at times, right? Like Crunch, for example. But you know, like the difference between like working on something like in games versus TV and film, it 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 felt like development cycle and like time. When I was working like at Lucasfilm, right. Uh, things needed to be done much quicker and it needed to be done. It, it's almost like we, we know the exact schedule. We're trying to hit these milestones. Like we can't go over. We're not going to change anything. The, the art direction because of like how quickly uh, assets needed to be, you know, realized and, you know, on screen. Uh, it, it's, it, it's like the art direction wasn't like, yeah, you know, just keep doing, uh, do, do 20 more of these things, you know, like, you, like in games, because we have time. It was more like, like literally the art direction was like, I like that part and that part, put them together and call it done. And we're going to shoot it out of a cannon and shoot it down the pipeline. And it's like, in that way, it, things felt so much more immediate, right? And same thing with like Love, Death and Robots. It was like, you know, again, like, we're trying, we're rushing to get this thing done. Right. Like it, it felt more, it felt more rushed. Um, and not to say that it felt like, you know, it was like any worse of an experience. It was just a little bit more demanding. You had to work a little bit faster, but you know, it felt the development cycles felt shorter. They felt a little bit more aggressive, the milestones you're trying to hit. Um, another thing that's interesting too, like in, in, uh, working, we say musicians, right? But let's just say like the entertainment industry, right? And like, I've only ever done like promotional art, right? But I've got friends who are like motion graphics artists, right? And they do like concert visuals for like really famous artists, right? Uh, 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 sorry, uh, musicians, artists. Uh, like, I got a friend who, uh, she's a neighbor. She's done stuff like visuals for Lil Nas X, Right. She's done stuff. I think at one point she was going to do something for Rufus to soul. You know, she, she's done, uh, she's worked with like Paris Hilton before and stuff too. Like anyway, interesting, interesting story there, but like, or, or another friend who, who has worked on, I can't, I think maybe Kid Cudi, I can't remember like what he's been on, but he's done a lot of concert visuals too. And whether it's concert visuals or it's like the poster stuff that I did, the, development cycle is even it's like 10 times more aggressive than everything else that i've just described because musicians you know they're not artists in in like the visual sense like we are they don't understand how a lot of the stuff gets made so they don't understand like the time that gets put into something to make it good like what it takes to make it look good and what ends up happening is maybe it's not even the musicians maybe it's just the their management right people that are managing them like there's this almost like unrealistic expectation as to like, well, how long does it take to make art? It's like, oh, you can just do this whole thing in like an afternoon, right? And you're like, I mean, I guess I'll just, you know, I'll, I might die in the process, but yeah, I could probably do that thing for you. Like, you know, whereas like if you're in like games or even TV and film, the people who are you're taking orders from are probably have at one point in time been an artist themselves, an art director, and they understand like art takes time. Sometimes you don't have all the time in the world, but, you know, at least everything I've done in entertainment, like with musicians, it's so much more rushed because, yeah, they just, they don't make the thing or the people managing them that are giving you feedback don't make the thing, the art thing. So they don't understand how long it takes. And it's just so rushed. So I feel like, yes, like development cycles between all of these things are so uniquely different. Uh, It's closer with TV and film versus games, but with like entertainment it's like they needed it yesterday you know like that's that's usually the feedback you get versus like games we have time we're gonna make the thing until you know we have to ship it and then maybe we'll crunch tv and film make it faster entertainment you're not fast enough we needed it yesterday like (laughs) and then you just don't sleep at that point basically uh but i mean other than that i mean i don't know there's a lot of overlap uh at least in terms of like the skill you're using to make the work to you know be a part of that industry so i don't feel like there's a lot of difference there i think i think a lot of it's just like the development cycle and then maybe also 
I don't know if you're if you're in like entertainment, right? You're working almost with like exclusively with like celebrities and personalities. Whereas like in games, unless you're like you know a voice actor or you're doing like mo mocap, like motion capture stuff, like I don't know if I don't know how often a concept artist is gonna like interact with a celebrity. You know, it's kind of it maybe it happens at some places. It depends. Maybe like Naughty Dog, where they hire, you know, like celebrity voice actors. And there's a lot of, you know, like it's a very like narrative, you know, kind of game that they end up making. I don't know. But like all the stuff I've worked on, like at least if it's games or TV, it felt very like isolated from celebrities and personalities in that way. But when you're when you're in something like entertainment, it's like you're you might be talking directly to them. You know, you may be getting feedback like an email directly with them. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It kind of varies. Yeah, like industries have, like, it's kind of interesting how different they are while at the same time being similar. Like, you know, working as an art visual artist, you know, in all those in industries, you know, uh, must be really, you know, kind of like, you know, eye-opening for you, right? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, yes, yes. I didn't, I didn't realize how... <laughs> like I didn't realize how how unrelatable celebrities really were until I you know worked with like a couple of them like like Nicki Minaj for example right like or I mean she might be the only like one that I that I really began to like understand began to understand the thing of like yes you know like their lives are just way different than yours otherwise they wouldn't be asking the things that they're asking of you and that's you know. Yeah, it's it, it was it was it was very eye opening. But I'm glad that I got to like experience all the different, you know, we'll call them creative hats because I think a lot of people, again, right? They they think they want to do something or they think this is like the artist I want to be. But then sometimes it takes like the experience to be like I don't actually enjoy doing this. Which for me, you know, I I I've got got to do a little bit of everything. And like if I had to pick a preference, probably like games, just because you know, you can spend a lot more time making a thing. It definitely, it's more risky too, because sometimes you spend too much time and then it just never gets shipped or it changes a oh hundred yeah. times. And it's not even the thing you care about anymore. I, I've known so many people that have, that started, started at a studio on a thing and then left that studio because it's now changed so much that they don't even enjoy being on it. And it's, you know, they're, they don't feel like they haven't contributed anything to it and all the work they did just gets thrown out. So sometimes that happens too. Right. But you got to like have the experience to know, like, do I enjoy doing this thing or not? Some people love the crazy entertainment thing I was telling you where they just like, it's like D day on Normandy beach. And it's just like explosions everywhere. I love this. And I'm like, I, I, hate this like that sounds horrible like i just want to like i want to be done with my work at like 6 or 7 p.m and then just go to bed after that i don't want to have to like you know be up all all night every night you know working on a thing you know you know what i mean like like work-life balance i guess is what i'm trying to say it's it's important yeah oh yeah definitely and um Here's before I move into the next topic. There's something. There's like an elephant in the room that we need to discuss. You know, kind of. You know, which mm-hmm. is uh, well. What are your thoughts on AI? <laughs> like, <you> know, <laughs> I we're doomed. Question. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know. Uh, I mean, we're doomed in like the Skynet sense because like it's Mid Journey is gonna access the nuclear bombs and no, uh, I don't know, man. What do, what do I think? Like it's uh, you know. It, it's it's certainly like ever ever more present. I feel like than it's ever been. It uh, it's especially with with <clears throat> I won't I will speak specifically on generative AI, right? Specifically like images because AI has been around like for for a long time. It's nothing it's nothing new, right? But like where we as visual artists are are most concerned i would say is probably going to be like generative ai right specifically anything you know it's it's mid journey it's stable diffusion uh you know the leon 5 database you know where where all the you know uh ill-gotten data is from you know that that whole discussion right like ethical sourcing of data all this stuff right it's i mean it's all very concerning it's all you know it's a topic that is being discussed constantly i see it I see it on Facebook. I see it on. I'm on Facebook. If you can believe it, I see it on Twitter. Uh, I don't call it X. 
because it's Twitter. Let's be real. And um, yeah, I I'm not like outspoken about it necessarily because I feel like there's so many other people that are doing such an amazing job of like you know discussing it and bringing awareness and you know they're 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 doing a great job. You know, I, I try to help where I can, you know, like donate some money to, you know, uh, I can't remember. Uh, it's, it's, it's the uh, creative efforts that people like Carla Ortiz are, uh, you know, uh, sort of championing, right. Like specifically like the class action lawsuit and all that stuff. Like she's, I don't know. Are you going to have Carla on here ever? You should have I, her on here at some no, point. Actually, no, here's the thing. I think I messaged her in 2020, 2021. Uh-huh. Uh, but I understand, like, for instance, someone like Carl Ortiz, she probably has 600 messages in her DMs, so... I could talk uh, to her. I could talk to her for you. I'm friends with her. She's she's she's, awesome. she's she's the most accessible human, like, no, ever. No, but at the like, same time, here's the thing. The presentation of my podcast wasn't really good back then, so... I <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, un- I understand, man. I do. I, I but, but I mean, like... I mean, like, someone like her is gonna, like, give such like su- such great nuanced information and takes on it. But, but, you know, that's just to say that like, I would encourage you and like, we can, you know, discuss that a little bit more. Oh yeah, uh, definitely. But, yeah. but yeah. So like people like Carla though, right. Like who have only ever, you know, put, put the, the, the well being you know, and the benefit of artists like ahead, ahead of herself, right. Like she's, she's spoken out against AI, like, Specifically, like you know, the um, the misuse of like ill-gotten data, like for generative AI, right? Like she's she's very outspoken on these things. Um, there's a bunch of other people too, like like John Lamb and like Zakuga, and I'm trying to think of like a few other. There, there's there's a few, definitely like a, a group of people out there that are like fighting the good fight, and um, I'm just thinking of the ones that I follow, like in the most immediate sense, right? But anyway, my two thoughts on it two cents on it would be you know obviously it's here to stay like I, I can't really say anything that like anyone else hasn't said but i i can i can try to maybe for non-artists that are viewing this podcast i can give like an artist perspective why why does it matter so much to artists like why is it upsetting well think about it like this right if you if you had dedicated you know, in my case, right, if you include schooling, I guess the last like 16, 17 years of your life to like a specific discipline, a specific craft, uh, a career, right, or a few careers, if if the sort of like existence of that career is being <clears throat> threatened, we'll say, aka threatened, or like extremely affected by things that are sort of out of your like initial control, right? Like the use of generative AI, like a tool that, you know, you could say one could argue might replace you. That would be a very upsetting and distressing thing. But, you know, is it going to replace us all? It's, I don't think it's as black and white as that, right? Like, it's not to say that it won't go away. Who knows what's going to happen because there are so many moving parts to this. It's all happening so fast. You know, it's 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 really like a very unregulated thing at the moment. But regulations do inevitably like come in. Like I would hope they would, and I think they will, right? Given all the sort of like legal interest that's been happening, the class action lawsuits, the people that are sort of inserting themselves in into the into the discussion, and what does that mean? And also the brands, right? The the, the giant brands like. You know, an artist getting ripped off on Twitter is one thing. Nintendo copyright infringement or like Microsoft or some other big brand, you know, with like a ton of like legal uh, resources, like that's a different discussion, right? So who knows like who will sue who and what will affect what regulations and like will the legal fees be so big that some of these like generative AI services get completely bankrupted from legal fees? All of these things could happen, but – what I can say in the most immediate sense is, you know, like, what am I seeing, like, happening in real time, at least in concept art? You know, I'm friends with, like, photo retouchers who, you know, work for, like, uh, magazines who, you know, they're seeing their jobs affected, right? Or at least, like, their pipeline is affected by, like, the use of these tools. And in some cases, like, junior positions at at these companies, right, are no longer needed because, like, the retouching has been automated away, or at least the tasks that they would get hired for are automated away by, like, the current iteration of generative AI. Um, 
And the same thing with concept art, right? I've heard stories about people who are, you know, their titles get changed from concept artist to art director because they're now utilizing like AI, you know, or a tool that is like somewhat AI. And, you know, they're sort of like by using it, they're actually art directing it, right? So they're they're an art director now, even though the artist that they're art directing is no longer it's not a human artist. It's you could argue it's 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 a it's ten million human artists <laughs> all rolled into one piece of technology. But like, it's a machine, right? And I don't know. Like, I feel like at least in the immediate sense, like what jobs could be replaced? Well, entry level stuff, more junior stuff, I would say probably, which is no help to someone who's trying to break into the industry. And I know if I. If I was 26-year-old Robbie and I saw this happening, I would definitely be like, <clears throat> man, like, should I even try like at this point? Because the human competition is so immense. This is already hard enough. I don't know how I'll ever get my first job. But then you have to compete with AI, right? And AI, you know, AI, at least in the immediate sense, what what mid-journey and stable diffusion currently are, which is not a sentient, self-aware truly creative thing that can replace, you know, an art director and a team of narrative writers, all that stuff, like, which is certainly being marketed as like right now though, like those roles, those human roles I just described, they're needed. They're irreplaceable. Like maybe, you know, the marketing art that a, like a really junior position would, you know, need to do, can 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 be you know uh, prompted in mid journey you know and in that case like that role you know that's no longer available that job isn't something that like an illustrator could get hired to do but at least for you know like the, the central creative core of something that is as nuanced as say like a game that requires people writing you know game designers creating like modes of combat you know coders scripting animators you know. Uh, you know, like animating things, you know, uh, human artists, you know, like, especially like in my case, right, like a concept artist, you know, like really thoughtfully designing something with intent. Like, these are things that mid journey currently can't do. Will it get there? I don't know, maybe one day, but like machine learning, as, as it's been, you know, described, it's not the same as human learning. It just isn't. And I've seen a lot of false comparisons, right, where people are saying, oh, well, like, you know, humans reference uh, the internet and Google, like, just like the database did for MidJourney. And it's like, well, but why? But, but look at what they're producing, right? One, the machine is producing, you know, from a distance. It's it's impressive. I won't I can't deny that it looks impressive, right? From a distance. But when you really begin to look at it with a nuanced take, right? You look, you zoom in even just a little bit, you begin to realize like it's just a lot of like really quickly collaged information. But you know, it's it it, it it's almost like a, a fancy picture that's been sort of slapped together, but there isn't a lot of intent and a lot of thought behind it like there isn't really really something happening not really <clears throat> which makes me think well the artist air quotes the artist behind this you know it didn't in intentionally design something right which which is really what art is art is an idea it's storytelling it's not just brush strokes on a piece of paper like so you know it's not creating artwork the way a human would because it didn't learn the way a human would. Like the two, the two are different, right? One is is like sort of like objectiveless, goalless, you know, collaging of pixels and, and data and information. Whereas a human artist, right, will take in the same kind of information at a much slower rate, you know, a human rate. And, you know, there will be, you know, a uniquely interesting thing that comes from like that human's artwork, right? From all that information that, that I would call that the human experience, right? Which is something that just AI just currently hasn't replicated, at least the things that I'm talking about. There could be some like deus ex machina thing out there that really is self-aware and like really has learned in a way that a human would, or maybe in a different way, but like you know, mid journey, like stable diffusion, these things aren't creating things with intent. You know, they aren't creating, not really. They're just sort of mashing things together and they're sort of regurgitating things in like a humanless, a soulless way. And it's, I think it's the humanity that is lacking in AI art that is the thing that just makes it feel different. It makes it feel stale. It doesn't make it feel interesting. It's, it's good enough in some cases to some people, right? Like say someone who, 
is 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 who would have traditionally hired an artist to do a promotional image this is good enough to that person you know who could have hired that artist but is it really like a true replacement for like you know what the the human artist would have made it, it isn't. It's good enough, and it replaces them in the sense that it's like that artist didn't get that specific job, and that is like the real time effects we're seeing. But if you had said like yes, like AI has replaced human artists, it's like in that particular case, it hasn't. It's just you know, like done a good enough job of replacing them on this specific job. And so I don't know. I don't want to ramble too much, but it's just to say that it's like yeah, it's this big scary thing, and I understand why people are upset about it. And and I. Like honestly, like I, I can't tell you if I'm losing work right now to AI or not because I'm in more of like a senior position, sort of, right? So like I'm, but here's the thing: maybe I am because last year I had last year was one of the driest years I've ever had in my career ever. I mean, it was so many no's from so many different studios that I applied to, and then the work that I did get was like. You know, it was very odd job type stuff. It wasn't what I would usually get hired to do. And, you know, I feel like a lot of people are going through that. I know a lot of people who couldn't get anything at all, period, last year between strikes, between all the layoffs with games. You know, it's it's a tough time for everyone. And maybe AI does have a very direct part of that. I couldn't tell you. All I can tell you is from my experience, like what I do get hired to do is something that like most forms of AI right now could not replace currently. But – you know, it, you know, if if I was in a more junior position right now, I was just trying to do, you know, maybe not even concept art. Let's say it's a game development studio, and there's like, you know, it's it's I'm a texture artist making terrain and scatter right in like the environment team. If that is simple enough to be automated away, you know, because it's not like something that you know requires like a ton of feedback. It's more of this sort of like procedural thing, you know. Like, again, right, that job is affected by AI. So it's tough to say, right? It's a lot of stuff is changing really fast. But I know, at least currently, human artists are still very much needed, and will probably continue to be. Um, and and my personal thoughts, let, let's say, let's flip the script for a second and say that the, the data isn't an issue, right? It's not. Everything's ethically sourced. Everything's been opted in. Uh, I don't know, you work for a company and they have their own database that they made. Uh, it's from assets that they own, so nothing's been stolen. Um, in that case, I look at it as a tool, right? Something that could force multiply my output. And I've tried, like full full disclosure, like I've tried mid-journey before, like, you know, back when it was like very abstract shapes. And, you know, it was like just more of this like interesting experiment because what I saw was I saw potential. I saw like, okay, here's a tool that could help me create like an interesting mood board that I could reference and maybe come up with some interesting, you know, shapes or form language, things like a step in the process, right? Nothing I would ever really paint over, but something I could look at and become inspired by, right? Like much, much like mood boards on Pinterest. Um, what it is now, what it's turned into now, other than a radioactive mess of like legal issues is like, um, it's so like precise and exact, at least from what I've seen, that it's like it's no longer this sort of like, you know, interesting, inspiring, ambiguous, like, you know, pile of happy accidents. Like it, it it's you know, it's not a tool I would even use now. I mean, because of all the reasons we just described, but like even artistically I don't find anything interesting whatsoever. It's so in some cases, it's like literally a one-for-one -one copy of the data that it's been feeding off of where it's like so copyright infringing that it's like that's crazy. I can't believe like whoever, someone's getting sued, you know? So yeah, like it could be a tool, you know, if done correctly, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm very much, uh, I'm an artist, but I'm also, you know, I, I provide a service for a client. And if I can do that more efficiently with tools, I will. It's just, when is the tool kind of like ethically questionable, excuse me, ethnically? no. Ethically, oh my God, I'm confused. <laughs> when is the tool ethically questionable and when isn't it, right? But there's a lot of potential there and it's certainly not going to go away anytime soon. It's it's just, yeah, it's been, it's been marketed as this like, it's been overmarketed, I think. People describe it as like, yeah, like it's, you know, it's like mid journey, like, you know, it knows shit. It's smart. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's like, it's not aware of anything. It's just a database of stuff 
you know, and you're prompting it. It's the funniest term I ever heard was like, it was something like, like being, being like, like ordering food from a vending machine doesn't make you a chef. And it's like, exactly. (laughs) So yeah, I don't know. I know that was probably a lot, but it's, you know, it's a lot to unpack, man. AI, it's a very um, mixed bag of emotions for a lot of people. I, I see it both ways. I, I think we've all been affected in some way by it. It's just, we just need to understand it a little bit better. And, and again, you know, yeah, like someone like Carla Ortiz, like has so much information on this and can tell you, probably explain it to you in a much more eloquent way than I could. So. Yeah, we'll definitely would love to have her on the show sometime. And by the way, speaking of, you know, AI, I actually, I mentioned this before we started recording, but I recently, you know, since the March of 2024, which is Mm. like a month ago, I started this new format of like, you know, group discussion podcast with previous guests of the podcast as well. And the first episode I titled it, if you're worried about AI, just watch this. And it was just two hours of us talking about, and I offered this thought exercise that imagine that even right now, there's no more art jobs in the industry. Everything has been, you know, taken over by AI and other stuff, right? So would you still do art at that point or situation? What would you do in that case? Like, what did you do with art? You know, would you go, what is your other option? You know, and we just talked about this stuff for like two hours. And at the end of the day, we realized, you know, if, and I, and I know it might be a little bit, you know, philosophical right now, but at the core of, you know, you're doing what you do. It could be anything, you know, but in this case, let's say art. Mm -hmm. If you're going to, if your whole goal of, you know, improving the cap limit of the improvement in your art is to be good at production or just to get hired, of course, you're going to get susceptible to a lot of, you know, changes that might happen in the industry, like, for example, with AI and everything. But if your core value of, you know, practicing your craft, let's say, which is art right now, is to act genuinely express yourself, genuinely improve at the craft, you know, always learning, always be a student of the game. Your work will definitely differ from your peers. You know you know what I mean? And you're mm-hmm. going to be less susceptible to all the changes that might happen in the industry. But of course, you know, that's, that's a loaded and hot take, in my opinion, because for two main reasons. When you have a family and, and, you know, you're just responsible for other people, you can't, you don't really give a shit about the philosophy of what you're doing that much. You just want to provide, right? So I get that. And at the same time, there's this whole issue of like, you know, as you said, you know, even with the way industries, you know, Craig Mullins posted that they, he needs, he wants, he wants a job. So my like take doesn't really hold any validity in this argument, you know, but if you think if you don't take what I said literally and actually think about it, you realize, hey, yeah, maybe I should, you know, schedule and program things a little bit differently, maybe a little, a little bit when it comes to you mm-hmm. know, improving and going on with art or Minecraft, you know. And <laughs> because here's the thing, we're talking and crying about this AI thing. All of visual artists, imagine, dude, the computer science students are cooked. Like with the oh, way. Oh, that's interesting. Dev- yeah, I didn't really think AI, about that. Devin AI has was really scared. Like this guy, I think the CEO of NVIDIA, I think, of course, you know, he's trying to, you know, sell a product or something, you know, but he said, oh, in 10 years, there's going to be no more programming languages. It's just going to be English language, you know, because it's all going to be used by AI, you know, with all the programming feature, which is technically could be correct. And it's kind of scary. I, I don't know. I'm not a tech savvy guy. So I'm sure, you know, someone will, you know, point my, the flaws in my argument out in the comments. Um, but definitely they're way more cooked than us, to be honest. Like right now, I don't think like, like a position like front end development is not going to be, I don't know. I, I don't think it's going to be something super hot, like in 10 years, 15 years ago or UI UX. No, no, no. Sorry. I take my word back for, for UI UX, but for example, with something like front end, mm-hmm. I don't think, yeah, I think those jobs could be really taken like like here's the thing another another thing i just realized when you mentioned about the ethically you know practicing the use of ai like let's assume like even from now on to at this moment till you know in the future everything all the ai uses is going to be ethical it's going to be you know all done by all the regulations and everything even if that progresses the jobs in the industry a lot of them will still get lower so regardless you got to step up and just expand your mindset when it comes to improving your art other 
like aside from just being just oh i'm just going to be production ready as a junior artist and i'm i'll be set no you should there should be something special about what you do and that's something special is your personal expression and it shows through in your work yeah yeah you know i mean I mean? You... So even if, yeah no 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 i mean i i agree i think i think what you're talking about like is is a good it's a good form to have anyway right the, other than like the obvious always improving but <clears throat> the reason people are going to get hired in the first place to do something is because you're providing something like an addition of a variance uh, like a, a different skill set something something new you're injecting like something new into like that pipeline into that team like if you just get hired like like no one no one's going to hire just a clone of uh, like or, or or someone that they already have they need someone new someone that gives them something different and it's just it's just more incentive whether it's you're competing with ai or you're competing with other human artists like you need something different that sets you apart like you always do and it's hard, right? Because like people, it's hard finding that thing. It's a fine line of like, how is it marketable enough that you can fit in and get hired, uh, and how is it different enough that it's not just the same thing, maybe slightly differently. So it's it, that's just to say that like that that's just what you said is like advice that you should apply to like all the facets of your career because it just it's like only helpful. And yeah, AI, it's like you know another another thing. It's I, like I didn't, I didn't. A lot of this, the stuff that we're discussing, is what made me finally pick up 3D last year, and you know, more into this year. I, I literally, I don't know how I got away with 2D for like just 2D for like 12 something years. You know, uh, a lot of doors have opened since. Uh, you know, having the uh, having like e- even just like basic 3D skill set. You know, something we're talking 3D for concept art, but still, like, you know, if, if you can expand your your bag of tricks, your your arsenal of weapons, it's like you're going to get more opportunities, including probably a better chance against AI, like you said. <laughs> yeah, the, actually, like today, I got an I had to update my Photoshop, and it updated to the 2024, and it added this new AI thing, which I tried, and I guess it's, it's still in its infancy stage because it sucked. Well, what um, is it? It's the generative feel thing. Oh, okay. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right to prompt. Okay. Like, yeah, I think it's still in the early development. I' really curious on how they are developing their, you know, which where do they get their data sets from? That's gonna be really interesting to investigate. But I mean, at the end- probably just the internet. So everything, <laughs> like, uh, like because you got to think about how quickly stuff moves legally versus like illegally right yep. like it takes no amount of time to just well i mean it probably takes some time to scrape the web right but we're talking i don't know hours minutes maybe whatever versus months if not years like getting like licensing like squared away with you know companies and clients and and you know resources and and sources and all that so it's like yeah, when I hear like another AI thing came out and it feels like it just came out, like there's a really good chance it wasn't, you know, I'm I'm, I'm assuming a lot here, but just like, yeah, I, I mean, how long did it take for you to get the licenses for those things? Like, you know, if something came out in a couple of years, I'd be like, I could see, you know, that. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm sure. Well, here's the other thing, man. Adobe doesn't exactly have a track record for being like, like ready for this a corporation like a big corporate entity is dishonest sometimes can you believe it i know <gasps> right spoiler <I'm> shocked. <laughs> i know right so right. like yeah i mean they could say where the data came from but you know how much do you really trust them like i i you know i've used adobe products for 20 years and i'm still like if, if i could if procreate had like a really dope desktop version i would just switch to that right now like i don't want to have anything to do with adobe anymore but you know i've also used them for two decades now so it's kind of like baked into my pipeline it's like a love-hate relationship at this point it's like it's like that it's like that toxic you know person you're supposed to break up with but you're also like (laughs) you know this is so us like and then you get back (laughs) together (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> oh god this being we talked a lot about video games but i never asked you this and you never mentioned like are you a big video game person like since you were a kid are, are you still playing video games or you were huge in video games when you were younger and what are your favorite video games by the way let's talk games a bit yeah yeah i mean i i do like games i haven't really played much in the last year uh bef- the year before that was at 23 is that when the dead when did the dead space remake come out i feel like that was like 2023 I don't know, but I think it was re- pretty recent. Let me check. It might it might have even been twenty two. Honestly, I don't like like end of twenty two. It's I the like short answer like I like games. I used to play them a lot. I don't now. It's uh, from mostly because okay yeah, January twenty seventh twenty twenty three. Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm very um the the way I experience games now is I usually just either I'll be in a Discord server watching people play it or I will watch a Twitch streamer play it, but I don't play mini games these days, mostly because I'm just so busy with the art stuff and like, you know, side projects that I kind of just like, I kind of, at a certain point in my life, I had to make the decision of like, knowing my addictive personality, you know, like I'm thinking of Skyrim when I would play it like all day, every day. And I like gained a bunch of weight and I was like super unhealthy and I was just eating a lot of food. And like, you know, this was like my early twenties. I, you know, I realized like, yeah, it's kind of one or the other. Like I have to like have like a balance there. And occasionally, occasionally, you know, I could get into something if it's like low commitment. Right. Um, but nowadays, right. Like to, to do the art thing full time professionally. Like I can't really, I just get a little too distracted if I get into a game. It's not to say I don't like pick up the controller every now and then. Right. Like an occasional Mario Kart match, you know, it's not a big deal. Smash Bros. Not a big deal. Like pretty like low commitment. But yeah, if you were like, are you gonna start Skyrim again? I'd be like, I, I mean, I guess. And I'm never gonna do art. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna be unemployed too while I play this game probably. So, but I mean, let's see. When I was a kid growing up, I was more. I was one of those kids who uh, I didn't have much money growing up, right? And so I was given one. You, you got one council, right? And it took forever to save up to get this thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, you know, I'm I was a Nintendo kid growing up. I played. I did PlayStation too. I wasn't. I wasn't an elitist. I just couldn't. I couldn't. I could have one or the other, and I just preferred more Nintendo games. You know, between like Perfect Dark, you know, Goldeneye. Uh, all the all the Super Smash Bros, you know, like Mario Kart, Donkey Kong, like all that stuff. Like, it's not to say I didn't enjoy Metal Gear and all that stuff too, right? Crash Bandicoot and all that PlayStation, but like, yeah, I I you know I definitely played a lot of first person shooters. I think that was like my main thing. I was a total Halo bro in like high school and middle school. I remember Halo Two coming out when I was, I must have been like fifteen, maybe fourteen or fifteen. I was definitely still in high school um and i remember, I remember waiting in line at uh gamestop for it like <laughs> uh like the day that it was coming out releasing i think i think it was midnight i can't remember it was it was late it was one night anyway um yeah so let's see halo played played a lot of perfect dark have you heard of jet force gemini do you know what that is that's the first time i hear it Oh, it's uh, it was Nintendo sixty four. It was again, it was another shooter. I think it was, I think it was more third person though. Um, but yeah, let's see what else. Yeah, I, m- I mentioned Perfect Dark already. Goldeneye, obviously, like a classic. Turok, like the dinosaur hunter game, fucking badass, dude. Like you're literally just like a dude with like arrows and and guns, and you're just killing dinosaurs. <laughs> um, Played a lot of racing games too, you know, Gran Turismo, Forza, uh, Zero, what was it F Zero also too? So yeah, I, I, I feel like the types of games that I mostly played was like it was either it was either shooters or like racing games, but like way more shooters. You know, I, I remember when Destiny came out and I played it like obsessively, and occasionally because it's been ten years, right? Ten years, I still pick it up every now and then. Although I have no idea what's going on at this point, I haven't followed any of it. The art looks amazing, always has. Bungie knocks it out of the park, and I'm excited for Marathon whenever that comes out. You know, mostly for the art style. I'm not really. I'm sure it'll be a, a cool shooter, but I, I think the visuals are what really drives me to Bungie games these days. But 
Uh, Dead Space. Played a lot of Dead Space, too. Uh, so some survival horror games in there. I wanted to start Callisto Protocol, if you know what that is. Yeah, I've uh, heard about it. Yeah, yeah but, I think it's. I'm pretty sure it's another like you know space zombie survival horror type mm-hmm. game, very much like Dead Space. But I have not played it. Again, the the art for it looks very cool, but have not played it. But what about you? What kind of games are uh, you, have you been playing? Well, I would have never ima- expected you to ask me this. Wow. <laughs> so. The reason I'm kind of acting like this is because I always I can't shut up about my favorite games in each episode, so I I think you know a lot of people will be annoyed by it. But uh, well, just just maybe like keep it to like two yeah, or sure. three. No, definitely. <laughs> um, you mean the games I recent I'm playing recently? Sure, or whatever you're pl- like, whatever you're playing now. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, like you know, from time to time I play League of Legends these days because I just play a match and I just go on with my day rest of the day because I don't really have the energy to put into like you know those are open world single player awesome games which i love by the way mm-hmm. but i don't have the mental energy or the mood to do it because there, i have so much stuff to do because i'm in a pretty tumultuous stage of my life right now I, i'm going to do uh, immigrate to another country for a second time the past couple of years so there's you know so many things involved but league of legends but about my favorite games of all time i guess as always i could go with fallout new vegas this coalition was a good one Baldur's Gate 3 was really nice. Cyberpunk. Um, oh, so I wanted to play Cyberpunk, but the dude, launch was like so dude. bad initially. I didn't it's, gotten, it's gotten a lot better though, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay, I cool. bought it when it was on a sale last summer at the end of September, July, I guess. July, I guess. September. Did, did, did I, do I actually forgot the months in English? Jesus. <laughs> September, right after August. July, yes. August. Correct. August. Oh, December is in fall. Jesus. Um, but it was in late September that I think, you know, the DLC got released. And mm. I bought it as a bundle package together. And boy, was that one of the best purchases that I've ever made. The game was just... is insane that it, it... Even it's like 60 bucks. It's insane. I think if it was even 120 bucks, I would still pay for it. It's, it was that good. Nice. Well, I'll, I'll probably pick it up then. It looked so cool. The art for it was like, oh, so it's cool. It's insane. Like, I actually had this conversation with Mikhail Kuz's episode. He mentioned you're basically paying for a virtual world, so 60 bucks is nothing. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Nice. You know, so I like that. These games are like that. Red Dead 2, I played it for an hour, or hour and a half, but I realized it's one of those juicy games that you actually have to put time for it, dedicate a time. At, so I had to uninstall it, unfortunately, but I have it in my backlog to play in the future. And yeah, these are pretty much the games that I really like and I recently played. Uh, but of course, I always love indie games. Whenever some new hit indie game comes up, like Lethal Company was really fun, playing with your buddies. I haven't played that. Uh, Wait, which one is it again? Sorry? Lethal Company, that one that you go to different moons and you have to collect items, evade monsters. It's really fun. It's really No, scary. no. I, I've been seeing a lot of people have been playing Helldivers too, and that looks Ooh, fucking yes. rad. Mostly because it's just, just, it's just Starship Troopers, which is like a classic, yeah. right? So, But like the game, it's Starship Troopers is the game. It's yeah, intense, it looks awesome. It's really fun when you play with with your friends. Honestly, I was I was gonna pick up Starfield, but because I was thinking it was like that's what I I know that's why I didn't. But I was gonna initially because I was like, oh, it's like Skyrim in space, and then everyone was like, it is actually, it is by the way, it's but is it, but it's Skyrim like space. not. But your well, why why your reaction? <laughs> Why my reaction, you might ask? That's a really good question. Because I pre-ordered this game as a birthday present to myself, like, you know, late spring last year, right? Mm-hmm. And I was waiting for September 6th. That was the date that it got released. And I clearly remember it. My first initial reaction was this. I played it and I rushed through the campaign. I did the most side quests as possible. I did the main quests. You know, main quests are the ones that are usually have an achievement for it in your Steam or whatever mm-hmm. console you're playing. And I went through all of this. I got everything. There were some good, good things and bad things about it as someone who... It depends on your expectation. If you're expecting an amazing game like at the quality of like production quality of Cyberpunk, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if you want literally Oblivion or Skyrim in space 
and you like games like that, that's cool. Like I mean, okay. honestly, like, like, like honestly, I the concept, the idea they had was really amazing, great, but their execution they flopped hard. It's mm. basically a loading screen simulator. It, it, the biggest, the best way I could describe it is, it breaks most rules of game design when it comes to how to make an immersive game. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's so much that I could go on for. Like I could make a two-hour video essay on it, which I'm sure you know a lot of people did on YouTube. You know those channels who make you know video essays about everything. You know, um, but if you just want to experience a one-time experience to just chill, have fun, enjoy a space-themed Skyrim, go ahead. Honestly, you know. But. <sighs> I'm kind of pissed that they kind of worked on it for seven, eight years and they spent like around 300, 400 million dollars. I've heard to do some reports and the result was this. And they hyped it up, hyped it up so much and everything. And they could have worked on the next Elder Scrolls. Uh, yeah. And the, and the reason it pisses me off, because here's the thing. Uh, for example, there's this whole meme about GTA 6 not coming out. GTA, we got this before GTA 6. We got, I don't know if you saw these memes on the internet. Uh, no, it's a new funny meme. Sounds like, funny though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's going to be released in two years, I guess. GTA Six, I guess one year, two year. I don't know. But the reason I think I thought about it a bit, like, it's kind of weird. I don't want to be make this episode a little bit, you know, philosophical or weird. But people wait and wait and wait for a project, but then you get the news that you know some fan who was waiting for this project passed out. I mean, passed away. Sorry, not passed out pass away and it's a real thing like there are a lot of star Citizen, for example like big project like a star citizen that has been in development for so long Mm -hmm. and a lot of people who pledged for it who donated and they were waiting for it just pass away you know and stuff like this kind of pisses pisses me off like you know they could have i don't know Uh, there's just i'm not in the back behind the scenes i'm just some doofus who makes podcasts on the internet right um but there's so many bad decisions being made, so many money being mishandled in this industry. And I'm sure, you know, for, as someone who's been in this industry more more than me, definitely, and more than a lot of people who might listen to this podcast, you can attest to that as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's the main thing that kind of pisses me off, you know? I mean, that's like what you said, like the whole, like they spent seven, eight years developing this thing and it was like, you know, somewhat inferior to what it could, could have been. Like, it, like that is probably like one of like the the bigger issues i feel like like a possible issue that happens like in in the game development pipeline where it's like sometimes you you're given too much time to work on something and then that is where and too much money maybe right so you have this this sense of like we we have the flexibility to pivot as much as we want to change things as much as we want to spend time burning ordinance and resources and it's just it, like without without a certain there's a certain level of urgency that it, like allows people to uh you know uh what's what, what's the word just br- bring something to fruition i don't know what i'm trying to say here they just yeah like you know at a, at a certain point you need to like produce something right and if you're given like too much leeway too much flexibility during that time like yeah, sometimes something can go on for what seven, eight years, and suddenly it's like, what? This is what you have to show for it. I think a good example of this too is like, there was this game Amazon created called Crucible, right? It was sort of like, if I remember correctly, it eventually became like a battle royale. And when I started on, I, I worked on it for like a year with like an out, an art outsourcing house, basically, right? It was this this company uh, called Hollow Spark. I'm pretty sure they've since. Um, you know, folded completely, but they, I think they had one other game that came out before that, but they, they basically, you know, they, they were doing a lot of skins and a lot of like conceptual uh, additions to this game to help get it shipped. Right. This was very much production. And, you know, I, I wasn't working directly for Amazon, but I was working, you know, for this, this outsourcing studio, like on this Amazon thing and it hadn't shipped yet. And, you know, I talked to a lot of people who had been on that game for years and, you know, they described this game pivoting so many different directions. And I think it did change leadership a couple times and Amazon spent a ton of money on it. And I think it ended up 
being something like let me i just want to like google this because like i don't want to like mess it up but like let's see uh that's actually not as much money as i was thinking why did i think that um okay i thought it'd be more money i guess i guess it cost about 80 million to make which is not no amount of money right but i think i think halo infinite was something like 750 million right which is like a lot more oh yeah dude oh yeah my my uh, art director right now at the place i'm at was an art director on that martin DeChambeau. um and he kind of mentioned like yeah like you know halo ma- halo you, you can look it up like halo it was a ton of money right that's almost a billion dollars that's like crazy to think about right <clears throat> um and I'm, I think it's since made made its money back, right? But but anyway, going back to the Crucible thing, um, yeah, when it finally shipped, it did. If I remember correctly, I don't remember the exact stage of events here, but it like was not received well. It did really badly, and then they actually put it. I think they put it back into beta, like so. It, it kind of like unshipped itself. I could be a little wrong on this, but like it, it just it came out after so many years, and I think it was something like like at least six years maybe more right which is that is so much longer than than it needs to be on like a a game right especially like a triple a game just like i don't know how long does it take to build in it like build the engine and then like you know actually like you know create the art for it it's you know it can't be i would think maybe three to four years like which is a decent amount of time but you know like that that sounds reasonable but if you're like doubling that you're rolling up on like a decade right like on a game just to make it without even like launching it that is an absurd amount of time so it's all just to say that like yeah like like what happened with starfield like reminds me a little bit of of the of the crucible thing because i'm pretty sure when crucible shipped it only had one map like imagine working on a game for like four or five years six years whatever and you've only got one location one map for the whole game that's crazy (laughs) you know what i mean so i don't know what ended up happening to to any of this you know but but yeah i it just it it reminded me it reminded me a little bit of my like time working with amazon on a thing so so i'm like i guess a lot of that budget for for example the halo infinite you mentioned you know could go to market yeah but i mean right now there are indie games with like less than like around 100,000 budget kind of like that and they sell millions and millions and millions you know and they and the thing is you know if you, you should know your audience well and you know when you market something you know like you, it it doesn't make sense 700 750 million like it was it was about 500 million but that's still even 300 million yeah, I know, I know. It's and and that that's that's what you know about like publicly, right? Like, it could be a lot more. <laughs> yep, exactly. And um, well, Palworld, for example, uh, its budget was six point one, six point two million dollars. And the story of it, actually, I highly recommend everyone who's I, listening. I remember Palworld. Yeah. Listen, go to YouTube and type in a story of Palworld. Like, it, a video is going to pop up about the story of the production behind the product. It's really interesting. It's actually mm-hmm. really legit interesting. I don't want to get, get into it too much. You know, you should listen listen, listen to it for yourself. But with that amount of money, they made something really fun. I actually bought the Palor. I, I tried it. It was, it was quite fun, honestly. It was really fun. Wasn't it, was, it, wasn't it, like, really, like, infringing on, like, Nintendo and, like, Pokemon? Or is nope. that just, like, hearsay? Oh, okay. No, not, not necessarily you know like sure there are a lot of like similarities you know with pokemon because uh you know they're making the concept of like you know there's this you know creatures who have certain like water earth like you know electricity fire type you know lava yeah classes and powers there's different classes of them if you breed two of them together you get a new one you discover a new one and there's so many other things and you literally use po- these balls that you have to throw them in and capture them is yeah, it's really similar to Pokemon, but when you but when you think about it, it's like I don't know. It's like Pokemon. Also, I, I saw this tweet thread that said Pokemon also, if if we're going by that logic, Pokemon should also be sued because they also 
cop not copied got heavily inspired let's use that term heavily inspired by another <laughs> i like that um, heavily inspired exactly heavily inspired by another ip which was really similar in this uh, structure of the design of it you know so i think i no i don't they didn't do anything in a one to one but what i can say they made a really good product that i can tell mm-hmm. it's like Riot taking the formula of any game genre they take and they make it something a more fun, enjoyable game to play. Like with MOBAs, for example. Uh, they made League of Legends with, you know, first-person shooters. They made Valorant. With TFT, they made, like, this auto-chess game into their own genre because the genre and the thing wasn't patented. So they just made their own game in the same genre, and they call it Teamfight Tactics. There's so many other things. So, so in that, by that logic, should they be sued? They improved upon the design and they made it on their own thing. They didn't steal anyone's IP or writing or world building or any stuff like that. You know, it's a genre, right? And not just that. Oh, what I'm actually seriously like, you know, waiting there, making an MMO. They they have an MMO in development for years. It's it's like a World of Warcraft type game, but instead in the world of the actual Rune Terra, which is the world that. League of Legends takes place in. I don't know if you've been into this stuff or you have played any of this or no, but I, I, I'm going to tell you something It's going to be amazing. If if what I think they're doing, they're doing. Oh, I forgot something else. They're also making Project L, which is I think is going to be released in a year or two, which is a fighting game with League of Legends characters. So they're, so they're making, they're, they're going to take over in the next couple of you know, years. Definitely. And Cool. Yeah, like, you know, especially the MMO project, I'm really excited for it. It's going to be really fun to see what it is. And what I really like about it, and they made a new studio, Right Forge, recently, and they're collaborating, outsourcing indie projects, like indie sell different games in the same universe with other indie studios, you know? I like so that. So they're making, they're making the right moves, but what I what I don't like about it, that it's kind of, you know... Um, the majority shareholder of the company is like, I think it's kind of embarrassing that I don't know this important information, but I, but they're basically owned by a huge Chinese mega corporation that I don't like. And the reason I say that is because monopolies aren't really necessarily good for industries because Mm. when there's a monopoly, well, if history teaches us one thing is that they never... And th- in good ways for us in an industry. Yeah. I mean, well, like, monopoly. Oh my God. Monopolies, monopolies. Well, made up a new word. Monopolies, like, you know, they're sort of like illustrative of like a, a what do you want to say? Like a disparity, disparity in like, you know, wealth, right? Like there's like a gap, right? And usually the way this works is like, if if someone has all the money, then everybody else has none of the money, right? So it's like, there's sort of like a uh, an imbalance of power and influence and uh, funding, right? That, that happens when there are like monopolies as well. So it's like, yeah, it's it's kind of like when you, when you look into like, you know, like a politician, for example, and you think about how much, or just any like incredibly elite, incredibly wealthy individual, who is a person who is not perfect, by the way, and you think about how much power one person can wield, it's like, again, you know, whether it's like a monopoly on power and influence or, you know, uh, like a games industry, whatever it is, it's just like, yeah, like there needs to be like a better balance of power, like in, in all things, I feel like when, when something like you said, like monopolies, right? Like when something's like monopolized, like it can be problematic for, for a few reasons. So I would agree with that. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, we'll see what happens, honestly. And well, let's go back to another topic that we were discussing before. You know, there's, you know, speaking of inspirations. So you mentioned that you don't necessarily use, you know, any sort of, you know, substances to your advantage. That's a weird way of putting it, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) But like, you know, you don't really use any anything externally but i want to know internally have you ever used any of your dreams as inspirations for your works or do you or how do your dreams are do, are you that type of person who don't doesn't dream at all or do you have those very weird detailed abstract dreams you know um 
You know, I don't remember what I dream about like half the time I dream about them. But when I do remember, it is like a very vivid thing. It, it's kind of – it's 50-50. You know, for one thing, I never learned about like the whole like lucid dreaming thing. I know that that's something like a skill that some people can develop. I've never – you know, been able to. <laughs> um, I'd love to. I'd love to be able to like participate in my dreams. They've always been like a journey, like that you're sort of along the ride for. You know, like I, you don't really like you're you're a passenger. You don't really have any control over it. Um, sometimes I've had dreams that are so vivid though that you you kind of think they're like they were real, right? You're like, oh, remember when that thing happened? And you're like, wait, 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 that never happened. <laughs> like that was a dream. Um, I don't, I don't really have like crazy dreams though. I feel like I'm trying, I'm trying to remember like a more memorable one. I, I, I know that like they're never bad. Like I don't have nightmares, right? Some people do. I've had them as a child, but I can't recall ever having them as an adult or even like a young adult or even a teen. Um, no, I don't. I don't really think I like vividly dream. Honestly, like what would like be like a good example? of that because i'm trying to think and nothing's really come into mind because like i said i have a hard time recalling what i dream about a lot of the time well um i could give a couple examples like since i was a kid i've always had super detailed weird weird dreams you know Mm -hmm. that i I always you know like dude i could i could literally like you know from the inspirations i have from my dreams since i was a kid i can make the most scariest you know movie or video game ever like actually is a scary video game or movie oh but interesting the, the reason i don't want to get into this stuff because the more i work on the material and topic is just going to be bad for my own mental health because to be honest and I don't, don't get me wrong i like horror genre and stuff like that but i'm not a huge fan of it to be honest that much like i mm-hmm. actually like it. i'm more like i don't know like how should I describe it? Like, like I'm more into like interesting stories more than anything. Like, of course, you know, horror elements could be part of it, but I don't necessarily like horror that much. Like, I like horror games. Don't get me wrong, but all right, I'm getting off topic. Let me let me get back to the qu- the answer to the question. Like, for example, I I remember there was a stream I had. It was like like a kind of how do you describe it? This is vertical. This is horizontal. What is this in English? Diagonal. It's- Diagonal, thank you. I, I'm forgetting your work. So no we're in kind of like a sci-fi advanced area with a bunch of population, and there was like diagonal elevator, and everyone was clamoring, and and my in my brain there was different camera angles as well, like a fucking movie production, and it, it would show me automatically different angles and everything, and it was rising, and there was this kind of green sludge toxic thing also rising as well after the platform that was going. And on the top of it, it arose and there was like a bird eye view camera then after the <laughs> platform came to the top and there was this huge city er- around this thing that the elevator reached its peak and there was this huge pyramid thing. It was afternoon and like people, it was kind of like a p- apocalyptic scene. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. And the, the, I can still remember the vivid details of that dream, the intricacies of the hard surface stuff. And I, I think I was 15, 16 when I had that dream. I remember a lot of my... It's weird. I don't remember every dream. I don't have a good memory. I have a weird memory. Like, from different times of my life, I remember things in very extreme details. Mm-hmm. Randomly. But then, you know, I, I have a normal memory. I don't... I, have even, I even ha- would go out and say I have a bad short-term memory, but for some weird reason, my brain lashes onto certain stuff, right? So, for example, this is a case of, like, a super detailed dream, you know, for me. Um, Like, you know, portraying events with different characters, specific faces, lighting, even sometimes sounds. You don't hear things in your dream as sounds, but the way your brain translates sounds is, like, it does for some reason, you know? Yeah. Have you ever experienced that? Like sound in dream, but it's not actually sound you're hearing. It's just a way well. Of- I mean, sometimes I've, I've like I've 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 thought about like maybe daydreaming, but definitely dreaming where like like if you could try to assign different sensations to things that like don't 
that aren't normally associated with those sensations, right? Like what is like a letter in an alphabet taste like, or what's the texture that a sound could have, right? Like th- things like that, right? Like I've, I've made some of those connections like here and there, like dreaming, or even actually, since we're talking about like, we mentioned substances and stuff earlier, marijuana, right? Has had similar effects to me, like where it's just like, I will, I've made a lot of interesting, some of the best conversations I've had w- with my old roommate, this this guy, Zach, incredible human being, right? Being super smart uh, engineer too, right? Like programmer, all that, big brain on the guy. We would get high <laughs> on, on marijuana and we would have a lot of these conversations, a lot of these thoughts, the things that we're talking about right now. And it's, it's just interesting because like whether you're dreaming or your neurology is like temporarily you know, augmented or adjusted, uh, you know, through like some form of like influence, like through substances, right? It's like you just, your brain works differently. You think differently in those moments. And those moments are where it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm making these like sort of like, I'm I'm mostly they're like high level connections that you would not make normally like in like a present conscious, like uninfluenced state. And it's stuff that it's so hard to explain to people in the moment because like while while stuff is firing up here in different ways, maybe forms of communication are like dumbed down, right? Like maybe you're talking kind of stupidly or you sound slower than you're supposed to because you're high, bro, or whatever. But in reality, like what you're really thinking about and maybe you remember – you have the foresight to write it down later or in the moment you write down notes, right? Like I've never tried to do this with drawing because I have no – motor skills when I'm like in a state like this, but I will, if I'm, if, you know, if I'm high enough, like I'll be thinking about stuff where it's like, Oh my God, like I just realized this thing and this thing have meant this thing the whole time. Or it's almost like therapy where you're like, I don't know if you've ever done therapy, but like, you know, I've been through, I've been through therapy for the last couple of years, like really focused stuff. And like, you know, me and my therapists have discussions. It's like having like, you're never given advice uh, necessarily like, like it's not an instructional thing. It's more of like a, I'm going to ask you like certain questions like about like that, that I want you to ask yourself or ask, you know, answer about yourself. Like it's, it's, it's sort of like this introspective process and like you, you look and you self-evaluate and you think about things and you come to realizations. I feel like a lot of times things like whether it's dreaming or something like marijuana, like have those same effects, right? Where it's like, it might not be like the most like linear path. It might not be immediate. It might be super immediate, but you, you make connections in your brain. Like your neurology works differently. And you, yeah, you have these thoughts like, well, yeah, like what is this? What if this thing had, like, yeah, what, what if a number had like, sound to it or like a texture or like like what flavor would like this color be like the color blue like stuff like again to to most people it's probably like what the fuck are you talking about dude (laughs) but you're like you know what i mean i think you get what i'm saying man like you just like yeah 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 i love i love making those connections uh but it it, those are the two ways it happens it's either like unconsciously or influenced somehow but you know yeah. You know what I've been thinking this whole time? If I was a researcher doing research on this, you know what type of person would be the perfect candidate to get some data from that could help us, you know, find patterns in how human brains work? People who hmm. are blind and deaf at the same time. Oh, that's true because they have to rely on other senses. Yes, what 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 happens when they sleep? What kind of dream do you see? dreams do they see oh yeah or, or how does their feelings about because here's the thing there are people who are of course they're at the same time deaf and blind at the same time but they can still uh, study you know live life you know as all of us of course but with different set of challenges um they can express themselves so you know that would be interesting to see you know what would that research entail you know but maybe it's something like that already exists definitely Definitely. Yeah. I'm going to search that up later after this podcast because it, dude, sure. my brain is sometimes, you know, thinks about something and I get the itch and I need to know it fast. So, of course, I don't, I'm not going to search right now. 
Like for example, the other night I was sleeping and I was really, really sleep, like dead sleeping. And in my brain suddenly boom. Who was the first person who even invented the screw system? The screw like you know, <laughs> Oh I, my god. <laughs> and I and I literally wrote it in my notes note in my phone and I slept. Then tomorrow when I woke up, I had my coffee, I actually did. Apparently the first technical time that screws were used was were by ancient Greeks, if I'm not mistaken. Then there was a sign of it in Egypt. Yes, a random in my brain, like I, I don't know if it's ADHD or something, but my brain does latch onto like weird things sometimes and it doesn't stop until I get an answer. No, I uh, mean I think I think it's just like curiosity, honestly. You know, I think people have like different levels of it and like yeah. there are different things that stimulate and fascinate people. That's the interesting interesting thing about people is they're so like uniquely different from each other. And again, that that's why like I'm like artists, like just lean into your thing. Like like people are people I think people are, are just genuinely afraid to do it. <laughs> just like people this is very this this example is more understandable, but like compared to like making art and Photoshop or whatever. But like, you know, w- do you, would you be interested in, you know, taking some like sort of like hallucinogenic drug that might you know like air quotes open your third eye? It's like, and some people would not. They would not be interested in like like f- for example, my my therapist she offers like ketamine therapy, right, and. And, you know, which is the closest thing to, like, you know, using, like, hallucinogenic, like, shrooms that, that like, a therapist could legally use in the state of California. Um, and, you know, like, it's 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 more of, like, a legal thing than, like, you know, anything else. But, like, you know, she she offers, like, that, that you know, possibility. Like, what if you, you know, rather than just having conversations and you were trying to, like, you know, do some, like, deep, deep diving on your, your traumas, your personality – you know, whatever it is, you know, that, ha- that, that might be like, you know, holding you back in life, you know, like, or if you're just simply wanting to like, you know, adjust your thinking, like that's, that's a possibility with her. Right. Like, and it's not done just through conversations, deep nuanced conversations, but what if like an actual chemical component could be added? Um, and like, because you're, you could be like permanently altering your neurology. Like some people are very cautious of that. Some people are totally open to it. I'm, kind of in the middle. I haven't really like experienced anything quite like that, but I'm open to the idea of it mostly because it's just like the brain is so expansive and it's like, I would love to see what else you can find in those deep recesses of your brain because everybody, there's so much people have that like, like people are so complex, right? And there's like parts of your brain that are like completely like unmapped by science. And it's just, Oh God, it's like, so it's like an infinite expanse like a whole galaxy up there, you know? And it, yeah. The whole thing fascinates me, man. And that's, yeah. And that, that's why like, I, I love like as artists, you know, you can, this, this is going to sound like corny as hell, but like you can literally be the architect of reality. Like as an artist, you can be like, you're a wizard, you're a digital alchemist and you can bend reality in the same way that like an act, like a, a level 20 X-Men could or whatever, you know, like, so why not just, go for it like stop playing it safe with your art man just like make something like take a risk you know that's all i'm saying anyway don't want to turn into like a rant or anything but i don't know how we got from brain to this but like i think you you could probably see like the parallels oh yeah definitely and we were talking about inspirations and speaking of inspirations who are some of our favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most no, I'll, 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 I just point to the, I just point to the bookshelf. Yeah. So, I mean, one really good one is Sergio Topi. If you know who he is, we'll put that right there for the camera to see. Yeah. For audio listeners, you know, love you to death. Go check out the YouTube version of the podcast we're talking uh-huh. watching right yes. now. At, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just just by name, right? Sergio Topi, incredible mm-hmm. artist, um, like really great, like just a master of like shape design and form language. Like he, he had this like inking hatching technique that he did, incredible stuff. Another one is uh, Bernie Wrightson, 
who does, you know, and this is like the sort of scratchboard illustration work that he did for the uh, Frankenstein book, the original Frankenstein book. Incredible compositions, incredible line work, draftsmanship, all that. Um, I don't – do I have any – oh, yes, of course, of course, of course, Moebius. We had to include him, right? Like, obviously. Probably one of, like, the most, like, I, I that I could think of, like, vi- visually direct – or visually obvious influences, like in my work specifically. But I mean, there's all kinds of like incredible people in here too. Another one, Sid Mead, you know, another another Titan. Uh, I mean, some some people that aren't really in my collection but should be, like Geiger, uh, Bikshinsky is another one. Uh, James Jean in the more recent years has been a huge influence. Um, trying to think what else, who else? Oh, uh, also, too, if you know uh, Ron Cobb design, that's the Nostromo, and that's the DeLorean from Back to the Future. Like another another amazing artist. I I think I was just talking about this recently with someone. Like why, you know, why are they so amazing? These guys. Because like they they set the standard, right? There there was no Pinterest, there was no Google. It was literally just. You know, there there was like their inspirations, you know, influenced them, right? But what they pulled from was so much more. I feel, I feel like it was a lot more ambiguous, like the stuff that they pulled from, right? They they didn't have like a catalog of again, they didn't have the accessibility to information that we do. A lot of their experiences were either lived, right, and experienced in real in real life, or you know, there was probably researched elements in there, but again, from from what pools of data, from from literature, from like maybe architecture, you know, it's it just their information was more limited. You know, they they didn't have concept art, con- conceptual design. You know, when these artists were creating like the things that made their careers, like there wasn't just as much information. So they managed to create, still to this day, like probably the most powerful most moving most like inspiring things and they did it you know from nothing essentially they did it from something right but honestly compared to what what we could pull from today nothing and uh i was i think my uh i think it was my art director asked me the other day like well he said something funny like because we we had this cool idea and it turns out that like someone already did it which is like you know everyone's already done everything right like you your whole the whole point here now right is like you know it's not so much about originality it's about like you know getting as close to original as you can right if you can make something different enough you know it feels new it feels different but really everything's sort of pulled from the same well of information that came before it right but these guys managed to do it in a way that like was truly uniquely them right and you know that's why their their work stands the test of time. He, my art director, also said something like, "Yeah, like if you wanted to be like a truly good concept artist, he's like joking when he says this, but like if you wanted to be like a truly good concept artist, like a great concept artist, you had to be doing this in like the seventies, sixties, or seventies. You know, back when like there was like there was nothing to pull from, and you were creating the thing that would inspire everybody afterwards." Um, and then someone mentioned like, yeah, you know, like, but if you were a concept artist back then, would you be as skilled as you are now? And it's like, probably not. Like I didn't have, you know, me back then would not be the same me as now because me now has Google, has all these art books, you know, pulled from all the things that came before us. But like, if I was back then, right, like if I was given a chance to try to be maybe like, you're in the same circumstances as Sid Mead, could I be Sid Mead? Probably not. That's what makes them so incredible. We'll never know, right? It's like it's like another comparison is like, you know, I, I like bodybuilding, like random, but like I when I was a kid, I, I love bodybuilding and I still love it even now. Uh, just like watching it, like spectating. Um, never been to any shows, but you know, watch the streams and stuff. And like trying to compare like someone who is on like the craziest steroids you've ever seen, the craziest gear, the newest equipment, like, you know, just a different, a different level of bodybuilding to try to say like, let's put this guy in a competition with someone from like, you know, the golden era bodybuilding, like, you know, classic physique. We'll put Ronnie Coleman, right. Against like Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's like, it's such a 
bad comparison because like one of them trains completely differently, has a different body type, different genetics, but also is just on way more gear. So it's like, it's the same thing, right? The gear as an artist being like visual information, right? So it's like, you know, yeah, like I don't think I would, I, I don't think I'd be nearly as creative as someone like Sid Mead because like my gear now is so much more potent than his was then, you know? And also he said me, he's just a genius. So it's like, but yeah, those are the guys. That's why I look at, I, I look at the, I always look, if I'm trying to like, if I feel like I'm getting too comfortable and familiar in like the world of like, what is hot, what is trending, what is relevant, right? What sells? I look at like everything that came before it, right? The thing that maybe isn't necessarily like, in vogue right now right and it's it, it's a lot of the old you know the classics the greats like they're the greats for a reason like they set the standard and they still continue to be like the standard in my opinion well i mean i can get the points you know the comparison you made about difference within art and you know bodybuilding you know how like i know the analogy you try to make but at the same time you know it's there's another point to it i think you know why they were, you know, so great at what they did, and they were so unique. It's because I think I don't know. I, I'm not a I'm not a great artist or anything. So you know, my opinion. I don't think in that regards, you know, anyone would you know take into consideration. But what I believe is that I think because of lack of so many external forces, and also like you know the technology not being so advanced, kind of you know forces uh, force them to actually like extract the full potential of their creativity because i think our kind of our brains are really spoiled these days with all this technology and just everything going on yeah. I, I think that's an important factor so yeah. their brain their creativity was raw was it's like it's that was like raw mountain honey this is our, and our brains today is like you know the supermarket you know sugar mixed with water honey you know kind of yeah it's 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 the uh, the vision is is diluted like to a degree whereas like when you design in a vacuum right like there aren't all these external influences that sort of sway and create like influence and maybe even bias and yeah no i mean i agree i think their creativity was so unfiltered and just raw and like un untouched by like everything so no like you bring up a really good point it's something i i should have mentioned too i just didn't think of it in the moment but like yeah no absolutely they they yeah like it's 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 just like pure like, like a more pure uh vision like more direct from the uh artist and not really influenced by by other art uh necessarily or other other artists or at least the art that we're influenced by today and also yeah the tools like yeah like 3d you know even digital right it's just all of it is like you know a lot of it's like training wheels you know that sort of like you know when taken away could handicap someone you know if they were thrust into the circumstances of the past which is like well do you actually know how to draw like and actually paint do you know like what the rules of perspective yeah again that's it's mind-blowing to think of like it's all hand-drawn it's or like even maybe not concept artists right but like remember like matte painters like traditional matte painters creating background art like full-on giant vertical pieces of art on panes of glass and it was just like you know you could tell it's a Pure painting but skill. like my god like some of it some of it's just incredible to look at or even i mean i was at in a couple of years ago before i'd moved here to la i was at a i think it was the academy museum and there was a miyazaki exhibit going on and they had all these gouache backgrounds from totoro howl's moving castle like and i actually own some some animation cells not from miyazaki but like you know like a uh, ava evangelion and like you know uh uh Oh my god vampire hunter d uh but like i don't own like background paintings getting to see those is like incredible and they're not as big as you think but you just look and you're like oh my god like someone did this by hand there's no control z it's just commit <laughs> you messed it up you gotta fix it <laughs> yeah incredible stuff i agree Oh yeah, like I remember when I was doing some sketches for some houses I wanted to make in 3D. It was like I was like doing the sketches in my sketchbook, and 
out of sheer like habit, I was just on control. Oh, I don't like this line control set. I was like, mm-hmm. no, this is an actual real life. There's no control set. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. I've been I've been inking these. Uh, I put them away. I've been inking these uh, coasters for like a, like a little like little beer coaster show, like this uh, gallery gallery nucleus uh, over in Portland, and you know. Yeah, I I usually like if I'm like sketching, I'll just like do ink directly on paper. But with these, I'm like because they only gave me four coasters. I'm like using pencils for like a little preliminary drawing and being like, is that perfect? Okay, now ink it. Because if I mess up anything, you know, I could use white out, but that's gonna look bad. So it's just like yeah, it, there's a degree of like craftsmanship and uh, de- decisiveness and like importance in decision making that happens with uh, traditional mediums that you just you have so much more flexibility digitally, but it does it make you a better, a more skilled artist? Like not necessarily, not not in this context, I think. Yeah, actually, that's an interesting topic. Like, um, like around two three years ago, I think when I kind of started to switch from graphic design to actually start learning fundamentals of art, right? Uh, so at first, you know, I don't want to get into too much into my journey, but I'm, I just want to bring up the subject. Uh, I'll get into it. Basically, at the time, because for me, this whole drawing thing, especially digital drawing thing, was a whole enigma and a mystery to me. So when something is a mystery to you, it's like this big, huge, weird thing, right? So you don't know how it works. And I thought, you know, oh my God, these people are so amazing. You know, they can draw everything and stuff like that. But little did I know that there, with the environment concept process, I would see a lot. It was just mostly photo bash, color pick, a lot of references, uh, just using the tool production tools to get the result. And yeah, for a production standpoint, you know, that's what you need. But before that, I thought it was just like, you know, as you said, old masters that they used to do everything, you know, by detail. And it was just, it's just I was, oh, it's just that. So it's going to be really hard. I need to learn all these fundamentals to the maximum. But when I, for example, I saw the workflow of some of my environment concept art friends, they were mostly just doing of course, which is, of course, that's a normal thing, right? They just you, you color pick, you use 3D as much as you want. You do all the stuff to get the result, which is a production thing. And for me at the time, I was like, and I started practicing and I did two very normal, basic pieces with very basic photo bash and, you know, stuff like that. And, I was, and to me that, I mean, I understand for a production standpoint, you know, that could be useful, but I I, I didn't consider personally I didn't consider them artworks. I don't know, is that weird of me to say that? Because I that you, because did, that you didn't consider those artworks? Me personally, I my own stuff that I used to sickness, I didn't because Oh, uh, I mean it's 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 not it's not weird when you understand when when you have a certain expectation of like this is the reality of what it means you know, for something to be considered real art. And then like the actual reality, not the expectation, right? Like in terms of process, when the reality is like, oh, it turns out this specific artwork was done in this way. It would make sense that someone would be like, well, but in my mind, like, you know, you have to create it this way with this process. So like, because you didn't, it's not, it's, it's not as good or it's not really as impressive or it's not the same. It's not art. Like, I see that all the time with, with people, especially non-artists, right? But the reality is, like, if in, – in my mind, especially nowadays, it's like I, I'm more interested in, like, not so much me personally, but, like, if you ask me, like, what would you consider art? And it's, like, any anything that is, like, a compelling idea. Like, it doesn't really matter how you communicate it. Like, is it – is it interesting? Is it compelling? Does it like evoke an emotion or spark an idea? Like to me, like that is where true artistic merit comes in, you know, because you're, you're telling something. It's a form of communication, like how, you know, you could use your words to communicate an idea, right? You, whether you're singing them, you're rapping them, you're writing them. It's like, it's, you're communicating ideas, right? So it, like, just like with art, like, is there an idea there in the same way that it's like, when I, I remember after years of being like a, like an actual, like a professional artist, right? Finally, like not like an enthusiast or a casual or like I'm a student, I'm like working and ha- having gone through a lot of these processes, like with clients, you know, I remember like family friends, you know, when I say family friends, I mean like, like a grant, like it's grandma and she's 
you know, f- DMing you on Facebook or whatever. And like, she's sending you a viral video and it's like a video of like artists recreates photorealistic artwork by referencing a photo. Right. And she's like, this is the most amazing. Isn't this amazing? And you go like, and, and I go like, not really. Like I see what they did. Right. Like they didn't really, they don't have an idea. They just, they did a technical exercise, but in her mind, the process is what like validates like its merit in terms of art. And in my mind, I'm at the point where I'm thinking like, well, but I mean, like, what's the idea? Like, where does like the creativity come in? Like, it's an impressive exercise. I'll give it that, you know, but in my mind, it's more of a cover song than an original piece of, of music. And like, to me, like in my mind nowadays, like I would say like, that is where like the true, you know, effort comes in, right? Like, you know, at a certain point, like your past technical exercises and roadblocks and you know you can cover a a song but can you write a song right and like so but i get why someone who doesn't you know uh write songs or create artwork or maybe someone who had never seen that process like what you were talking about in the beginning like maybe they their initial reaction might be like oh that's like disappointing or i don't like consider that like it's not as valuable to me because like real art is done this way it's just like a difference of of thinking but yeah, hopefully what I'm saying makes sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. And what I meant by what I'm saying is, like, at the time, I didn't have a good grasp on the fundamentals at all. So mm-hmm. when I would, for example, would draw, for example, a skull as an exercise on Photoshop, and I would color pick the values, to me, that felt like cheating, absolutely, because I didn't understand the mixing of colors and stuff like that. Production-wise, I could do it, and it felt amazing. I was like, whoa, I just did that. But then yeah. deep inside, I know, Ramtin, you're a cheater. You, you don't <laughs> actually know colors. You just color paint. And I kept yeah. telling myself that. And I actually heard uh, uh, from one of my friends who told me there are pros in the industry who don't, they just color paint their whole career. And that's fine. You, you want to be a production artist. And, I lo- I, and here's the thing. What I'm trying to say is that made me feel like a to have bad imposter syndrome felt like a fake or something and stuff like that because at the time I didn't know how the industry and the, like worked you know like don't have to be like a wizard in all the fundamentals to be considered like an artist or be get hired or get a job or make pieces but as you said your point I think is really correct you know as long as you communicate a meaning or expression or something that could be considered art subjectively but I'm but I'm not talking about art I'm talking about art as a medium as well technically you know so I wouldn't call myself artist in that regard, if I have to be honest, you know. But as you said, you know, there are people who make art with any anything, any tool or whatever they use to express something. That's fine, you know, right? And the funny thing is, I feel like a fake for color picking and using, for example, Blender in my artworks, if I, even if I have to. But then there's people who have the audacity to say, Artists are gatekeeping art. No AI art is real. You're calling us prompt engineers, like you know, not artists. We are artists. This is art. This is made by humans. I don't understand this people. <laughs> like, like, listen, here's the thing. I literally felt bad for using color picking because I thought that's been lazy. Wrong thing. You need to practice fundamentals first. Get a good grasp of fundamentals, then use the color pick to save time. That's the correct thing. I think everyone should do. just go with the fundamentals, then add the tools in the repertoire of things they add. But these people, they, they sleep nice and well at night knowing they're artists while they're just using AI prompts. They just write a bunch of words. Are these people real? I mean, I think I think a lot of it comes from... I mean, there, there are people who enjoy the, genuinely enjoy the process of creating art, right? And then there are people that don't, but they still enjoy art, you know? And I mean, when you, you one could argue, well, like, what is like, what does it mean to enjoy art? And someone could say, well, it's the process of enjo- of creating art. That's what to me it means to enjoy art. And then other could be, people could say, well, I just enjoy looking at it. I'm more interested in the final result. And if I'm tasked with producing it, I'm only after the uh, the finish line result, right? Those are the people that would probably be fine with, you know, just simply prompting something, spitting it out of a generator and being like, here's the thing. Um, 
And then there are people like like myself, right? Like even when I was like trying to like get something useful out of like you know AI in in the past, it's like I I was like I, this is like like I would never like it's cool to experiment and it's inspiring. Like it's creating some ideas for like mood boards that I would reference, but I I could never like there's so much I would change. And also I don't even enjoy like, like, like I, like I enjoy creating the art too much to like not have any human input whatsoever. Like I, I, you know, like, and because of that, I just, I couldn't get anything like interesting out of the process. Like it just wasn't interesting to me at all. Right. You know, before I dropped it entirely, but like, I, I mean, yeah, like I, I don't know. Some people just don't, like they couldn't be bothered like in the creative process. Like they, they never painted something with their hands and like, they don't feel the need to try. And why would they now with something as, as immediate and as gratifying as, so quickly as something like, you know, like, like a, a mid journey or whatever, like AI, right. It's, it's the, the results are so immediate and, you know, there's probably a psychology there too with like, you know, hits of dopamine, right? Like similar to social media, right? Like, oh, these likes are really, you know, inflating, inflating my neurology and it feels good, right? The immediacy of it, it's like, you know, feed, feeding my reward centers. It's probably a similar psychology with like, you know, the immediacy of like, I never thought I could be an artist and here I am just pressing buttons and boom, there it is. And, you know, yeah, th that person has probably not painted something before and really understood the process that is both frustrating and rewarding to like start something and see it through to a finish, you know, the, the journey of creating artwork. But I mean, yeah, like you're someone who enjoys that process so much. It is this like really unrelatable thing, right. To be like, really? Like you're just fine with like, you know, having a machine make this thing. And it's just like, I had nothing to do with it, but like I, I get to say, because it was my prompt, like, Prompt and ain't easy, fellas. Like I'm an artist too. It's like not necessarily <laughs> like so. I get it. I, I yeah. I think it's a different way of thinking. It's hilarious to see. It's like no, you're not. I mean, that's again. Go 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 back to the 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 analogy of the vending machine. You know, or I'm ordering something from the vending machine. I'm a chef. It's like most chefs would laugh at you. Like, what are you talking about? You didn't make anything. Like you just you just you know hot water on a bucket of noodle. That's it. Yeah, yeah, you put some coins into into you know into a machine, and then like a something came out, but you didn't you had nothing to do with it. Yeah, and it all looks the same too. <laughs> you know, it's it's like you you just because you got like a instant ramen noodle packet, it's like there's ten thousand more of them, twenty thousand more of them out there that look exactly like your ramen packet. It's like nothing you, nothing interesting about it from an artist perspective. So like, I get why you're like. Are these people serious? But some of them are. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, yep. <laughs> a lot of them are. The we live in a weird world, to be honest. Like, yeah. I mean, I, like, here's the thing. You can fool everyone, sure, at some point, but you you know you're lying your, yourself, so you're aware of that, and you're okay with that. I, that's what I don't get. Yeah, I mean, people are so layered, it's kind of, like, hard to tell, like, because, like, I mean, you could say there are types of people, but, like, even those types of people are uniquely their own people in some way or another. So it's like, why do people, why does a specific person do what they do without really knowing them or their life? It's, like, hard to say, but I'm sure there's probably, like, similar circumstances with all with all of them i mean the one i'm seeing at least the most is like they're not actually like artists or they've never been working artists you know like even the most even like the artists that are utilizing ai as a tool right now like openly right like they're making artwork they're posting it they're getting likes maybe they're even doing client work with it whatever um there's still I feel, I feel like a lot of them, I, I'm not going to say all of them because I don't know, but like I'm thinking of a few who it's like they, you can tell they're using AI in their process, but they're still, some of them are still like painting elements of it. They're putting some, some kind of effort into it because they were an artist before AI was, was this tool that's accessible in the way it is now. Um, but I feel like most people who, who you were describing earlier, it's like they've probably never created any art at all, or at least a lot of them probably haven't. So there's probably like 
tendencies and patterns in in people who think that way. But uh, either way, yeah, it's really it's really weird to say, man, see, man, it's like I, you know, like I wouldn't use a soundboard and be like, I'm a musician. It's like, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> Not really. I not in the way that you're making yourself out to be. And you know what you you know how you're describing yourself. You know what you've done, sir. Oh yeah, definitely. And all right, so let's move on to another subject. By the way, we're only like two, three questions away from the end of the Okay, because because I got I got a call at three with my uh, with my boss. So no worries, no if worries. we if we can power through these, sure, sure, sure. Let's sure, do sure. it. Okay, we got eighteen how much minutes. Time, how much How much time is it till three? By the way, eighteen minutes. That's great. Do you know why? Because it's been like two hours and 39 minutes we've been talking. And if we talk for another 11 minutes, we will set the record as the longest episode of the podcast. At hour That's so funny. All right. Yeah, this let's is, do it. Yeah. Okay. So the longest episode was Anna Moshak, which I think was episode 195. And she her episode was two hours and 50 minutes. But this one is going to get the record. So, yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do this. Um, so the next question is: What are what non uh, non NDA project you can describe and tell us about that you're working on right now? Whether it be personal or professional project. I mean, there there is that uh, the ride view one that we talked about, right? There's also Numinous, which is, I mean, that's that's been ongoing forever, man. That's like since 2016. That's what. Wow, dude, that's crazy. I think that's eight years ago. Eight years ago, I started working on it. That's wild. That's And I'm not sure where that's going to go. That's probably going to end up being – I mean, it's it started out as, you know, like I would just like to make a book, uh, which by the way, making a product versus a project is – there are two different things, everyone out there who <laughs> is working on something of theirs. Um, but like – yeah, like I could see it becoming like a multimedia project, you know, like I could see, I mean, if if I had the right, like, you know, studio behind me, you know, like if I had my own development studio for a game, I would try to make it like some sort of VR puzzle game or like interactive experience. I could see it being like a 10 episode anime similar to, I haven't, I haven't even seen it yet, right? But Scavenger's Reign. Have you seen that? Yeah. No. Oh, you no, haven't? no, no. Do you know you know what I'm talking about, though, right? No, no. Actually, let's, let me check this. Oof, animated. you got to check out Scavengers Rain. Animated. Ooh, it's, it looks interesting. Oh yeah, there's it's been a few Netflix? people that have DM me and been like, "You worked on this, right?" And I'm like, "I wish, man. That looks awesome." A lot of it is. I feel like a lot of what that show does, though, is probably similar to what I would want to do if I was going to do like something episodic with the Numinous project. You know. Again, like alien terrain, other world encounters, you know, interesting creatures. I feel like that show is probably a lot more like char- character driven in terms of narrative. I haven't seen it, so I need I need to watch it. But the visuals, it's I'm pretty sure it's based off of like a, a very a very small animated short. Uh and that was incredible to see. So yeah, if you're interested in like alien worlds, you know, like if you want to see almost like how do I describe it? I mean, it it, lo- it looks like a like like a Moebius like movie, basically, <laughs> at least in terms of art style, you know. So, but yeah, I mean, what else? What else have I been working on? I mean, you know, Magic the Gathering, but that's like you know, that's like I, I'm not really working on anything with them right now. I've worked with them since 2012, though it's been it's been many years. But I feel like a lot of what I've done is out there already. You're you're talking about what's what i'm currently working on right now yeah no that's can probably... discuss that is of course not under nda naturally right 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 yeah i mean i'm not working on anything else that is not on nda other than what i mentioned <laughs> there's so much yep. stuff that's under nda uh yeah sorry all right fair enough <laughs> all right so the next question is what's other non-arts related stuff you got going on in your life so if you can believe this, I uh, I like to bowl, you know, bowl. And uh, I was part of a league for a little bit, like last year. It was pretty cool. Um, but no, I mean, let's see, bowling. I'm thinking, oh my god, this is where this is where I start to describe like a dating profile. It's like I like hikes and like long walks on the beach and like, but all that stuff is nice actually. Just saying, uh, yeah, L.A. has so much stuff in it, you know. 
um, it's like a hundred cities rolled into one, which is, I, I mean, I love that aspect of LA and between the weather and the car culture, there's a lot of opportunities to do like car meetups, which is really cool. Um, again, like being a kid growing up in Detroit, you know, it's like, you see like all kinds of like cars and you're a little boy, you're like, Oh my God, this is like the coolest thing ever. Like look at all these Corvettes and Vipers and Mustangs and, you know, Camaros and just like, uh, even like exotic cars and, you know, like Japanese imports and stuff too, just like cars everywhere, man. And, um, that's, there's just a lot of that in LA. So I, you know, I try to go to like meetups as much as I can, you know, I have a Corvette. So like, I'm, I'm not like a Corvette stand or like a Chevy stand or anything, but just like given the price point and the performance, um, a lot of bang for your buck. It's a C7 Corvette. So it's the last iteration front engine before they switched to mid engine. So now the C8, which is a current generation is mid engine. It basically looks like an Italian, wedged shaped you know exotic from like the 80s you know it's very cool i just don't think it's a corvette but it's interesting but anyway i went for like the last analog you know traditional stick shift version of a corvette i could find so you know yeah i tend to like do like lots of like socializing with like car groups and like car meetups and stuff and um you know Let's see what other non-art related stuff. I fitness has been a part of my life for a while, so like I tend I tend to like yeah be pretty active. Like gym, go to the gym quite a bit. You know, uh, sometimes it was like two two times a day, but that's way too much for how much work I got going on these days. Uh, it tends to be one, yeah, maybe like four or five days a week these days. Uh, and and yeah, like hiking. Again, no, it sounds like a dating profile, but like I love to hike, man. Um, another thing too, I could probably show. Yeah, hold on. Ugh. So, you know, I love to build kits. I don't have time these days anymore, right? Damn. But as That's an example, cool. right? This is the. Uh, this is a master grade version of the Saza B, which is a Gundam, you know? Well, is it, is it, is it a Gundam? Is it made of Gundanium? Oh. I know it's a mobile suit. I can't remember if the Saza B is made of Gundanium or not. That's that's the only difference between a Gundam and a mobile suit, right? For all of you, like, mecha nerds out there. Um, but I actually can't remember if the Saza B is an actual Gundam or if it's just, like, a really powerful mobile suit. Anyway, um, yeah, so I like to build kits, you know, um, they just require a lot of time and a lot of like physical space. And I live in, you know, I'm renting a place. I don't have like a, a proper workspace. Like if you're going to be painting these things, all the decals and details, uh, you need proper ventilation and all that stuff. So I, yeah, I haven't been doing kits as much lately, but that is something that I used to do a lot. Uh, it's pretty fun. Other than that, I mean, yeah, I try to game, like I've mentioned. Like, it hasn't happened much lately because I just don't want to get, like, addicted to anything. But uh, I try to game whenever I can. But, uh, yeah, nothing – nothing, not a whole lot. I've been, I've been very deep, deep in the thralls of uh, my current gig. It's one of those things that it's, like, so fun that I'm, like, you know, just – giving it my all like you know even maybe like working on like stuff like after hours because i'm like i was having fun with that and like i don't know if you've ever done this but like i'm totally the guy that like i'll like walk by something that's like not done and look at it and be like just like just like 30 more minutes and then i look and it's like four hours later and i'm like shit i just like worked Whew. but like you know if you're not keeping clock keep, keeping a, a, an eye on the clock like you know you're having like a ton of fun doing it right so like that's totally exactly yeah whether it's like art or personal art stuff but like you know i i feel like that is because it's a new gig and it's exciting i'm just like i'm uh i'm tapped you know bandwidth wise uh after work so i don't have a lot of like time or energy you know i just kind of like just kind of work my job right now eat food, go to bed, <laughs> go to the gym. It's very like routine, routine right now. Yeah. All right, man. Well, we have reached the final question, a section of the podcast, which is called time capsule. And in about two minutes, we will break the record for the longest episode on this podcast as well. So that's <laughs> going to be interesting. Um, so here's how the time capsule thing goes. Imagine you had only a 
only a limited amount of time, like let's say a few minutes, a couple of minutes. And in that yeah. limited amount of time, you, I want you to tell us the most valuable life lessons, the most important and valuable life lessons you've learned thus far that you could summarize for us in a couple of sentences as a human to another human being. And that another human being is anyone who's going to listen to this podcast at any point of time in the future. And also... Take your time. Don't worry if your answer might be cliche or anything. Just speak from your heart. Sorry. So, what's the uh, what's the uh, thing I'm answering? <laughs> the most valuable life lessons and important life lessons you've ever learned. Okay. Like, yes. 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 As cool as it can be, like to get you know your dream opportunities, like don't. Don't sacrifice them at the expense of, like, your own actual well-being. And what I mean by that is, like, everything we've talked about, like, mostly art-related, right? Like, and I'm talking specifically about art. Like, it's just art, you know? Like, you you can't make anything if you're dead <laughs> or you're too sick to work. So, you know, you really do need to put your health, both mental and physical, first before any of this stuff. And once that's good then you know everything else comes after it but but yeah i definitely over the years have had a l very difficult time with the whole work life balance and you know i've gotten sick from it before i've you know worked worked too hard for people that didn't care or didn't like reciprocate and, and never would right because at the end of the day you know like this is this is a, like a service for a client and while it might be something that you absolutely love and you enjoy and you throw yourself into it's not more important than like your own like physical and mental health and both of those things can suffer if they're neglected and deprioritized in place of the other thing i'm talking about so just you know put put yourself like above all the other things we've talked about because it just it's just art <clears throat> it's important, but it's not that important. You're more important, you know? And again, like, I, I, I feel like I, I would just go back to this, like, so much is is make make the stuff that you enjoy, that you truly enjoy, you know? Like, do what makes you happy, even if it's not going to make you the most money. Because especially if we're talking art and you're in this for the money, like, you're in this for the wrong reasons, man. Like, art... People who make money as artists, like they're, you know, that's a very circumstantial thing. And I feel like a lot of times it's something that doesn't happen intentionally, you know, like you just happen to be really good at your job. And then, you know, you find yourself in a really, you know, cushy financial position, whatever, you know, but like most, most of the people that I know, including myself, who are like truly fulfilled and truly happy doing what they're doing, they're doing it because they love to do it and not necessarily because it makes them a ton of money. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's the wrong motivation. So, you know, fill your portfolio with the stuff you like. Don't like, don't do something because you feel like you have to do it. Like that's, again, that's the biggest difference between a job and a career. Like if you, if you love to do characters, do characters. If you love to do them in a specific style, like do it in that specific style. Like you can always tell when, a performance or a movie or and anything, anything that was created by someone to be consumed by someone else, when that is like given less than ideal effort, if it's like phoned in, air quotes, like phoned in even a little bit, like people can tell, right? Like when an actor isn't giving their best performance or they're just like, you know, they weren't really into it, right? Like authenticity it, it always like shines through, but like it has to be authentic. And the way things are authentic is by being done like from a place of love. So you have to like love what you do. And like, again, it might not make you the most money, you know, but like it, it might not be the most like marketable thing, like, but you'll love doing it. And like, that's, that's like the best payment. I feel like it's, and I get, I get it, you know, like bills and stuff. Cool. But also like, you know, you can make money doing all kinds of things. Like, do something because you love it is, is really, like, the best piece of advice I can give. And I don't know, like, any – I could reword it a hundred more ways, but I won't. Just, like, that would be my final piece of advice is, you know, do the things you love to do.
Perfect. Yep. Perfect note to end the episode on. Thank you so much for coming by and taking time out of your schedule and coming by this episode. Where can people contact you if they had any questions? Is your Instagram account okay? Yeah, yeah. Or or uh, Robbie Trevino zero zero at Gmail. You know, feel free to drop a line there. But you know, I do I do check my DMs on Instagram if people ever want to reach out with questions. Absolutely. Even even Twitter. I'd say Twitter. It's not X. It's Twitter. Anyway. Yeah, Twitter. <laughs> exactly. And well, the links of Twitter and Instagram, of course, down in the description. And I guess that's about it. Thanks so much for coming by. And thank you to anyone who tuned in and listened to this episode or watched it on YouTube. Please leave a comment down below if you have any suggestions or comments. And the reason for the past two hours and an hour, I started start speaking slower because it's 1 a.m. now. And my neighbor recently filed a noise complaint against me like a week ago. So I have to be more careful. Right. And <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and with that being said. There you have it, folks. The longest reigning episode of the podcast right now in the past four years. Let's see if it'll get broken in the future. <laughs> uh, but for now, take care, everyone. Stay safe until the next episode. Bye-bye.